Okay, Martin, if you'd like to get us underway. Sure. Well, hello everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, welcome to our final plenary session of the LISA Symposium. I hope you've enjoyed the week as much as I have, and it's a real pleasure to welcome uh, our speakers for this final plenary session. We have two talks before the break from Feria um, Ozel and from uh, Deirdre Shoemaker. Then we have a panel discussion after the break focusing on the Voids 2050 um, uh, process and uh, a number of papers, uh, white papers on gravitational wave astronomy that were submitted to Voids 2050. Uh, but let's get underway first of all with our um, opening plenary this morning. And that's from Ferial Ozel. She is Professor of Astronomy and Physics at the University of Arizona, where in January 2022, she was also appointed Associate Dean for Research in the College of Science. She received her bachelor's from Columbia University, her master's from the Niels Bohr Institute, and her PhD in astrophysics from Harvard University. She was then a Hubble Fellow and a member at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton prior to joining the University of Arizona. Uh, Ferial is widely recognized for her contributions to the study of neutron stars, black holes and magnetars, and she carried out pioneering work on the first simulated images of low luminosity black holes that guided the development of the interfer interferometric imaging capabilities of the Event Horizon Telescope. Now, the EHT results have recently achieved enormous global impact and acclaim, and that indeed is the theme of her presentation today. And I'm really delighted, therefore, that she's able to join our symposium amidst an incredibly busy schedule. So uh, let's all welcome Feriel. Over to you. Thank you so much for this lovely introduction and for the invitation to talk to you about the Event Horizon Telescope results. Let me share my screen and get started. Okay. Um, first, let me tell you also that I am very excited about LISA, about the prospect of uh, measuring this um, metric of supermassive black holes with, um, with gravitational waves with LISA. And I very recently actually just wrapped up a study commissioned by NASA on the um, NASA ground segment for LISA. And we made recommendations for, of course, um, a lot of support from NASA for the science that Lisa is going to do. So um, that was just the spring and I'm, I'm very excited about that too. But that's not what I'm going to tell you about today. As Martin said, um, I'm here to tell you about the Event Horizon Telescope, another way of studying supermassive black holes through interferometry and imaging. So let me jump right into it. This is the array of the Event Horizon Telescope. It's a global array of um, millimeter wavelength telescopes uh -huh. that span yeah, Sorry to interrupt, Fidel, but we're not seeing your second slide. We're still seeing the, the title slide. Oh, interesting. Um, okay. Let's try again. How about now? Um, we're seeing the Event Horizon Telescope 2017 observations. Otherwise, the slide is is dark, but we're it's not the I title see. slide. <laughs> okay. Um, well, how about this one? Do oh yeah, yeah, that's one? just fine. Forgive me. I think the previous one was showing exactly what it should have showed. Um, I, I just wasn't sure, but but we're now seeing how interferometry works. Well, um, it's a movie, so when I start playing it, I ah, think you're no longer seeing it. We're no longer seeing it. Yeah, unfortunately. Okay, that's that's what's happening. So I wonder if I should stay like this and try to show you. Yeah, um, that's working. Okay, so um, th these this is just a visual of the many dishes that make up the Event Horizon Telescope Array, um, spanning the globe across many continents. Um, and um, they have capabilities that, that can record data at a very fast rate. They also have masers to do very precise um, clocking of the, of the waveforms that are arriving. Um, it's technologically, of course, the, um, the hardest thing we have done in millimeter astronomy, this very long baseline interferometry. 
Um, and the combination of the data is what gives us the resolution that we need in, to image the horizon scales um, of, of supermassive black holes. So I'm going to keep moving forward like this, I think. Um, I'm really not sure if going to play is going to work. How about how about now? Are you seeing? That, that one is just fine. I, I, I guess it's maybe the movies where there'll be the biggest possibility of problems, but for static slides, it. it looks fine. Okay. All right. So um, just the basics of interferometry. I'm sure you're more than familiar with this. Um, uh, Lisa also being an interferometer, albeit different. Um, when, when we're imaging with interferometry, each telescope pair measures the complex Fourier component of the image and gives us one spatial frequency. So if the telescopes, the projection of telescopes is separated by L, um, the spatial frequency that we get is L over lambda for, uh, for EHD. At this point in time, lambda is 1.3 millimeters. We're extending to 0.86 millimeters as well. So that gives you just one point in your Fourier space. Obviously you can't make an image out of one point. So we rely on the rotation of the earth um, to increase the coverage of the Fourier space. Not only that, but of course, if you have N telescopes, you have N choose two pairs that slowly fill out this Fourier space. And with this, um, we are able to get a lot more Fourier components of the image and eventually um, able to get the image of the black hole itself. I move to the next slide. Can you see it? Yeah. Oh, well, okay. I'm sorry. No, no. Um, no. I, okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm just going to keep it like this. I, I, Thank you. Um, yeah. So um, the goals of the Event Horizon Telescope when we started out was direct imaging of two black holes at the horizon scale. And how did we determine that? Um, this, this plot shows you the 1.3 millimeter flux on the y-axis and the EHT resolution that you could achieve um, with, with the global size array for the pre-known mass of that black hole. So you take M, um, um, you calculate the Schwarzschild radius for that black hole, and you say at the full array resolution, what, what is it I can resolve? So what you will see is that there are a bunch of other black holes, quasars mostly, um, in this triangle over here that are bright enough in the 1.3 millimeters, but because of their mass and distance combination, the HD can resolve the accretion flow, but not the horizon scale. Because of that, um, the way we describe it is that um, at the horizon scale imaging um, goals, uh, EHD has two main targets, Sagittarius A star and M87. The size of the dot is the size, the mass of the previously known mass of the black hole. And as you know, they're apart by a factor of 1500. This one is also a nod to the international collaboration that makes up the EHD. So let me just show you a little movie of the many people um, that contribute to the telescopes, the analysis, um, the simulations and um, it's really just like Lisa, uh, just like the Lisa Consortium, um, a global effort um, that, uh, that we've been working on uh, for, for many years at this point. So um, assuming that you all have heard a little bit more about M87 uh, since 2019, I decided to focus this presentation more on Sagittarius A star, the newer result that we, uh, we were able to publish in, in the May of this year. Um, but having said that, these are still 2017 data. We have a couple more years in the can and we just wrapped up another observing campaign um, in April of this year. Um, and one of the things that, that determines when we can observe is good weather in all of, all of the telescopes. Um, as you can see, for example, during this 2017 campaign, the skies look blue, and that is the most important thing for radio um, at 1.3 millimeters. Um, the moisture content in the atmosphere, um, it makes it impossible to, 
to observe, even though it's not a daytime, nighttime thing. It's really a good weather, low moisture thing. And that's part of the reason why all our telescopes are in high and dry places like the uh, high deserts of Arizona and, um, and Chile and, um, and um, the Pyrenees. So um, as I mentioned, these are 2017 observations. So let me go ahead and show you what the coverage um, looks like. This is the, again, the Fourier um, map that I was showing you, the UV uh, coverage of now SAJ star on April 6 and 7, the dates with the best baseline coverage. Um, in the 2017 first global campaign, we interleaved observations between M87 and SAJ star, um, depending on when they were rising. And um, the, these two particular dates ended up being the, the best in terms of imaging capabilities. So obviously there can be azimuthal um, variations along an image, but just for the moment, let's take all of these different azimuthal components and plot them on a, on a single, um, put them on a single plot as flux density as a function of baseline separation. So each one of these is a different baseline, again, color coded depending on the pairs of telescopes that have given rise to, to those data. And what you see is this ringing pattern, just like we saw with M87, very nice clear signature of, um, of either a ring or a disc because the, the Fourier um, transform is a Bessel function. So looking at this, you can already see that we're going to see either a disc-like or a ring-like structure. And not only that, but um, the characteristics of the Bessel function tell us that the first minimum in this visibility amplitude where you're seeing this dashed line gives you the size of that ring or, or disc. So um, for these um, SAJ star data, the, um, the diameter of that ring is 52 um, micro arc seconds um, for, for a, um, minimum at uh, 52, uh, sorry, for a um, minimum at three giga lambda. So the x-axis here is plotted in terms of um, giga um, 1.3 millimeters. So um, let's go ahead and, so th again, this tells you already the, the gross image characteristics, but of course we want to do a lot more with this uh, with this image processing in order to understand the details of it and in order to calibrate it um, to see what the space time properties are like. I'm going to take a couple of minutes and also tell you uh, why SAJ star was harder than M87. This is a question that we get often. Why did we publish M87 before our own black hole at the center of the Milky Way, Sagittarius A star? Um, and there are a couple of reasons for that that I want to uh, walk you through. The first one is the interstellar scattering. When we are looking at M87, we're looking away from the disk of the galaxy, whereas when we're looking towards our galactic center, of course, you know, we're looking through the disk of the galaxy. And the free electrons in the disk scatter the 1.3 millimeter light. And uh, this causes two effects. One is the diffractive blurring. The other is the refractive noise. So this is the variable smaller scale component. This is the blurring component um, here shown for an unscattered image that looks like, of course, this is a synthetic image um, that looks like the one in the leftmost panel. The um, Scattering effects could have been detrimental, but they were not. Um, so we, uh, we have used observations at other wavelengths in order to really bound what the effects of both uh, refractive noise and um, diffractive blurring could be. And again, this is from that paper um, that, um, that shows um, how bad it could have been. For example, it could have taken a ring-like image and turned it into what you're seeing here, uh, where I'm showing with my cursor, but they were not. So um, what the blurring does is 
it reduces the power at the long wavelengths, as you can see here. So these are the um, two different models for the blurring. And this is the refractive noise, which you can see is uh, well below our data points, especially at the baselines that determine the size and the main shape of the ring. So this is the peak. This is the first minimum that I was telling you about. And this is the second uh, maximum. And out here at six to eight giga lambda, where for the first time we have information, we didn't have um, those longer baselines for M87. And that's because the South Pole Telescope was also able to um, see Psi J star. Uh, it can't see M87. And now we have this uh, longer baseline coverage. And that's where um, we, you have some effects of refractive noise, but below the, the data amplitude. The second reason why Psi J star was harder um, is uh, variability. The variability time scale, the dynamical time scale around a black hole is set by its mass. M87 uh, being 6 billion solar masses compared to Psi J stars for 4 million solar masses has a variability time scale that is of the order of many days. Psi J star is on, on the order of minutes to hours, depending on the black hole spin. Um, and because of that, we were actually bracing for a lot of variability. So the image changing on the time scale where we wait for the rotation of the earth to fill out that UV space. And of course, if the image morphology changes significantly on the time scale of the observations, it makes the reconstructions very difficult to, it could all the way to impossible. For decades or at this point, literally two decades, we've run GRMHD simulations um, to understand the characteristics of the accretion flow. And we were expecting based on those simulations, the flux to vary like what I'm showing you on the left. Sag star was kind to us. It varies, it varies for sure. We have had a flare on one of the days that was captured by Chandra uh, throughout, uh, through our multi-wavelength campaign. And there is certainly some flux variability that you're seeing here. But again, it could have been detrimental. It absolutely wasn't. In fact, the, um, our simulations, um, as good as they are in predicting other characteristics, um, they are predicting too much flux variability. So this was uh, an easier job, but it still took us a couple of years to convince ourselves that we have taken care of each one of these difficulties. Let me go on to imaging. Um, I already showed you the UV coverage and even for our best coverage days, uh, you can see that there are also uh, missing pieces of information. So what we do for that um, is both develop different data analysis pipelines that make somewhat different assumptions and some, use somewhat different, for example, regularized maximum likelihood versus clean uh, type of image reconstruction techniques, and also just make a somewhat different assumptions about how to fill in that missing information. How do we smooth over? How do we regularize? How do we penalize? images that, that change um, too much. So um, this is something also that's also relevant for LISA. Um, these different pipelines of analysis um, actually increased our confidence in, in what we were seeing pretty dramatically, because when you do vary these parameters in these different pipelines and can look at what are the robust features of what you're observing, of course, um, that is uh, that is something that is um, very reassuring in terms of um, the missing data that you might have, or some unknown calibrations that you might have, et cetera. So these are reconstructions with different algorithmic parameters. Um, what that gave us is um, images of four clusters. So when you run this top set, I allow all my parameters to vary. I fill in that missing information, um, then I make the images, and uh, then I we, we ran a clustering algorithm on it. And these are the averages of those four clusters that you see. And um, this, this last cluster makes up um, 
less than a percent of all the images, but the good, good part of it, and let me see if I can show this to you. Hopefully it will, hopefully it will run. So again, these are the four clusters. This is the average image. What you see is that each one of these clusters matches in the overall size and overall characteristics. What differs between them is the location of these bright spots that, um, that appear. The bright spots could be real. In principle, our simulations show us that as the uh, as the gas moves around a black hole, the, pl the hot plasma of these low luminosity black holes, as it swirls around the black hole, it could have variations in magnetic field strength and density that could show up as these bright spots. However, because we have incomplete uh, UV coverage, the directions in which uh, the north, south, and east, west directions that are the primary uh, directions of our of our telescopes also affects where these um, bright spots appear. So right now, even though in principle these could be real, we take the stance that they are mostly artifacts of of our imaging uh, algorithms. Not the algorithms themselves, but but our um, imaging uh, capabilities with the current um, telescope. Okay, so. Um, with this, hopefully, uh, you see that the average image is robust. We can determine its size. We, we have a good idea about its, um, its gross characteristics and morphology, if not its, its small details in terms of brightness. So let me move on to um, testing the black hole metric in the next 10 minutes. Um, because this is, of course, where the biggest synergy with, um, with LISA is going to be. What can we learn from imaging? What have we learned from imaging for SAJ star and, and M87? And, um, of course, the, the future uh, prospects also um, with other techniques. So I'll start by showing you a gallery where we explored alternatives to the Kerr hypothesis for a black hole. And what you see here are images from a GRMHD uh, simulation with a Kerr metric, analytic johansson saltus metric, analytic Kerr-Sen, uh, boson, star dilaton, wormhole. So we explored a lot of alternatives with plasma models around them and asked if we were to image them at 1.3 millimeters, what would that look like? Boson star you see does not have a hole, but most others have a, a ring characteristic um, that could appear to us the way that a Kerr black hole could appear. So even if Sag star were and M87 were not Kerr black holes, they could still show a bright ring surrounding a shadow. These again are low luminosity black holes. Image formation is very particular. Um, so we um, we run the plasma models, a variety of plasma models, allowing for the unknowns about electron temperatures and magnetic field structures. And um, we, uh, we do ray tracing and, um, and radiative transfer on these and ask ourselves, where, are, where is the brightness pattern appearing? Where is the hole that is associated with the, with the interior of the uh, photon ring appearing? So the key distinguishing characteristic is really the size of the ring and the shadow. Where does this appear with respect to the space-time characteristics of the black hole, like its uh, mass and spin? And of course, in, in other metrics, um, the metric, uh, the non qr metrics, other deviation parameters or coupling parameters. So um, we take this entire library and um, now we want to measure the image size so that we, we get this bright structure, but we also want to understand how that, um, how that couples to uh, the, the um, shadow size, which is uh, what is set by the, the various metrics themselves. So the first thing that we did was a robust measurement of the image size from 
the um, Sao J star observations with uh, EHD observations of Sao J star. So uh, again, EHD measures the size of the bright emission ring. These are the three pipelines, different data analysis pipelines that I already mentioned, um, making different assumptions. And this is the fractional width of the ring that each one of them measures versus the mean diameter in micro arc seconds that each one of them measures. Um, these are the, um, the um, various confidence contours. And this is the projection of those contours in the mean diameter. They are statistically consistent. You see that there are small differences between them, but we also have a ton of synthetic data to work with to understand how these algorithms behave on synthetic data so we can fold that into our measurements. So in the next slide, um, what I want to show you is how we go from the ring diameter to the shadow diameter and connect it to the, to the space-time parameters. What you see on the left is for this entire set of simulations that I showed a couple of slides ago, what is the relationship between where that ring appears and the size of that ring to the diameter of the shadow that we calculate either analytically um, or uh, in, in most cases um, numerically if there's a, um, if, um, especially if there's an asymmetry in the, in the shadow itself. So these are the full GRMHD curve simulations, a library of uh, quite literally millions of images um, that we collectively ran across the collaboration, much like your waveform efforts. And um, these are the analytic curve. We said, let's relax the assumptions about GRMHD and allow the plasma to do other things that we don't see in the GRMHD simulations, but stick to the curve metric. And a third set, which is the analytic non-curve, this time, as I showed you here, allowing both the space time and the metrics to change, sorry, the space time and the plasma model to change. And what you see here is when you look at the ring diameter minus the shadow diameter over the shadow diameter, you see a distribution that is consistent between uh, these three models, even though you allowed for this freedom. And you can quantify this fractional diameter difference um, using this, these libraries of simulations. This is great news. What this says is that, yes, by changing uh, the, uh, the space time, I can make much larger rings, I can make much larger shadows, but they track each other. That means that when I measure a ring size, I can, with this uncertainty folded in, convert that into a shadow size. There is a second uncertainty that arises from taking a, a, a ring-like image and with incomplete coverage, with that scattering that I mentioned to you, with atmospheric distortions, um, with incomplete UV coverage, making a measurement. So if I know the ground truth and I run it through these synthetic data generation pipelines that, um, that fold in all of these other factors and then apply my three different pipelines and, and say, what did I measure? I know the ground truth. I made synthetic data. These are the distributions for the three algorithms that you see. I'm going to point out that these statistically insignificant small shifts that you see are identical to what you're seeing in, this, in these data. So HDM Clean and Smiley perform the same way on real SAJ star data here as they do on these large synthetic data libraries that, that we tested them on. What this means is that we use these synthetic data to correct for what we call measurement biases. I know the ground truth, what am I measuring? We use these other sets of simulations um, to, measure, to connect the ring size to the shadow diameter. And then we can take these two uncertainties and use it to measure the shadow size from Sajay star data. 
which That's is what we're doing. 25 minutes gone now. Excellent. Thank you. Great. I just have a few more slides. Great. Um, so that's what we did for SAJ star. Um, what you're seeing here are all the linear combinations of an imaging algorithm with a library. What am I using to correct it? Um, GRMHD and EHDM or Cur and Smiley or non-Cur and DiffMap. So these are the measurements. Uh, the, this is the normalized probability density over the shadow, uh, the shadow diameter, the angular diameter in micro arc seconds. And um, these are the, the various combinations uh, that you see of correcting uh, for those, for those um, both biases and uh, how the image tracks the space time. So these solid lines here are the, is the range of these uh, of the peaks of these, and this shows the 68% contour overlaid on the average image that I already shared with you of Sag A star. So um, this is great, um, and of course um, Sag A star. Uh, one advantage that we had compared to compared to M87 is a very precise mass measurement prior to the EHD observations that came from decades of effort by the UCLA and, and Max Planck groups. Um, and we used both of those angular sizes, these uh, M over D measurements um, from Keck and, um, and gravity as two different priors and also folded those in um, into our uncertainties. So, um, Let me let me also show you. I'm going to skip this for now. If we have time, I'll come back to this question of um, does it have a thermalizing surface instead of a horizon? By using the multi wavelength data of SAJ star, that's a separate question we can answer in addition to this metric test. Um, that that we're doing. So I'm going to skip that for now and go straight to the comparison to the cure prediction for shadow diameter. So these are the measurements. How, how do they compare? I was just telling you about this prior information, this angular size um, that we have from um, Keck and VLT. We use it to predict the uh, Schwarzschild shadow diameter. And we said, okay, so this is what we know for the Schwarzschild diameter. Let's allow for a fractional deviation. And of course, it, uh, there, we don't know a priori what the spin of the black hole is. Uh, the current measurements aren't sensitive enough to, to, um, to measure the spin, uh, the very small differences. So um, in this formulation, anything of, for this deviation parameter that's between zero and minus about seven and a half percent is consistent with the cure prediction. Um, so these are the uh, the LTI um, and and Keck statistical um, and systematic errors based on stellar orbits. So now comparing our measurement to the shadow size that is predicted for. Um, for these prior mass measurements, we get um, these two um, these two final plots. Um, again, these are the various combinations of um, how we um, how we correct for measurement biases uh, and how we calibrate the sh uh, shadow size to the image size. And what you see is um, these are our measurements, and this band here is that zero to minus seven and a half percent um, that I mentioned to you uh, for the curve prediction. And um, what we are finding is, is very good consistency uh, with the curve predictions um, and the uncertainty is about 10%. The reason it's better than um, M87s is primarily the, the better known um, M over D. Okay. So um, that's this comparison. Um, the, this was for um, M87, assuming the, um, the stellar, um, 
stellar dynamics measurement of the mass. And this was M87, that, that ambiguity about if, what if you use the gas to, to, um, to measure the mass. And, um, and this is the Sag J star, which is uh, smaller errors in M over D lead to stricter constraints. This is, in our uh, view, um, a, a good step forward in understanding general relativity around black holes. These are the uh, some of the best measurements from LIGO. Um, of course, we're now eight orders of magnitude different in mass when we go from the LIGO measurements to Psi J star in the million solar masses to M87 in the billion solar masses. And uh, we are seeing consistency across all of these mass scales um, when we look at uh, constraints on general relativistic predictions. Let me leave you with this last slide, synergies with LISA and other GR tests, uh, which as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, we are very excited in the next decade to be able to do this with gravitational waves through dynamical measurements, a completely orthogonal um, technique that is going to be sensitive to the same curvature and potential scale as our primary targets with, uh, with the EHD. So this is this um, this is the Lisa ellipse that I put on the um, this nice compilation from um, Baker Scordis and Saltis um, a few years ago, um, and this is where LIGO and Virgo live, um, and um, of course um, you see the solar system tests, pulsars here, S stars uh, orbits of S stars around Sag J star, and um, these two that come closest to um, the horizon scale um, that is shown with this red line here. So I will stop there and take questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ferial, for our wonderful talk, some really beautiful results. Um, and let me also note that we can fix in pro processing the slides so that they are full screen. So don't worry about that. Um, are okay. there any questions? Uh, please use the Q&A a box if you wish, or indeed raise your hand and uh, we can relay your questions to Feriel. Well, maybe I'll ask one to begin with. It's kind of maybe the obvious one. You mentioned that there is uh, further data that you're processing, but in the longer term, what is the, is the future plan? Is there, for example, any scope for um, maybe in the far future, including um, radio measurements from off the planet? There are plans for short term, medium term, and long term. So um, one of the things that I'm very excited about is um, future observations from Earth still at um, 345 gigahertz or 0.86 millimeters. The reason for that is, of course, as you change the wavelength, you change the resolution um, of the interferometric array. So it increases our resolution by a little bit. But even more importantly, the GR effects that we are looking for are achromatic, plasma effects are wavelength dependent. So having these two wave bands in which we perform our observations are, are going to be another handle on what is the plasma around the black hole doing? What is the space time of the black hole setting? Um, so that's the short term. And um, Doing year-to-year -year observations is, is an opportunity to look for any sort of variability in the morphology of the image. I already talked to you about hour-to-hour, day-to-day timescale variability. Um, we don't see significant morphological changes on those timescales. Year-to-year could be a very different ball game. Um, so we have 2018 data that we're working on. We have this year's data. We skipped a couple of years because of COVID and, and technical difficulties. Um, and then the question that you raised, uh, which is, can we do this from space? We would love to, of course, it would uh, change the resolution of the array uh, significantly if we went to a, an orbit that is uh, perhaps maybe a third of the way to the moon. If we went to a low Earth orbit, it wouldn't change the resolution, but it would change the UV coverage drastically. Of course, if you had some elements and you had continuous um, orbital um, coverage, 
then you would fill your UV plane in a way that is not possible um, from uh, from Earth-based telescopes. So all of these um, all of these are in the works. The difficulty with, in our case with going to space is the data volume. Um, yeah. Some of it would have to be onboard processing. This is um, we uh, we collect petabytes of data a night because of this uh, accurate timing that we have to do with masers. It's mostly noise, but you have to record it. Um, so we would have to do something about either onboard correlations or a more clever way of bringing down the data. Thank you, that's interesting, yeah. Um, I see we have a question come in from Hontas, uh, who's asking about the possibility for gravitational wave observatories working in collaboration with the EHT, for example, to observe an in-spiral by both EM and gravitational waves. I appreciate that the, you know, the imaging of the central black hole would be impossible at the distances of gravitational wave sources, but are there other um, multi-messenger observations that EHT uh, might be able to make of um, the EM counterparts, for example? That's a very good question. Um, it would be interesting to see what EHT resolution for various sources um, would look like. It's Probably it's not going to be enough, uh, at yeah. least the, the array as is, Earth-based array, mm -hmm. um, to get us to interesting enough distances where there are uh, in spiral events. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, is there some overlap that, that we could exploit? Uh, we, we could look at that. I'm, I'm guessing probably not yet, but uh, maybe with the future array. Okay, thank you. Um, I think Alistair maybe had a question and then we will need to move on. Alistair, do you want to do that um, live, so to speak? Uh, sure, I can do that. Um, yeah, it wasn't a particularly um, expansive question. I was just wondering um, about potential next targets that you had in mind. Um, so going back to going back to this slide, I think it was this one. Um, we are observing all of these targets, and we have um, we have in fact been publishing on the jet structure uh, of some of these targets. So we are able to get a much clearer view of the jet closer to the um, to the um, black hole and um, its morphology and whether it changes when we go from the longer wavelength observations, for example, with um, with other telescopes and to ALMA by itself and then to, to EHD. Um, so we are working on what we can learn about the accretion flow and jet and polarization for all of these targets. But as far as horizon scale imaging and um, metric tests, SAJ SARA and M87, repeated observations and this other wavelength that, that I mentioned are, are going to be. Our, our primary goals. Thank you. So I, I think we should move on now, but let's thank Thiriel again for a wonderful talk and for demonstrating to us that impressively wide dynamic range over which we are now testing GR. And we look forward to Lisa adding to that in uh, the next decade. Um, so let's now turn to our second plenary talk of this first half of the final session. And I'll invite Deirdre to share screen. And once we are set up there, I will introduce Deirdre. Okay, good. I think we're on full screen. Fingers crossed that works. Um, so let me introduce our speaker. So Deirdre Shoemaker is a physics professor and the director of the Center for Gravitational Physics at the University of Texas at Austin. She received her bachelor's in physics, astronomy and astrophysics from Penn State University and her PhD in physics from the University of Texas at Austin. She was then a postdoctoral fellow at Penn State and Cornell, and then held faculty positions at Penn State and Georgia Tech before moving to UT Austin in 2020. Deirdre's research interests center on black holes and gravitational waves and understanding these and other aspects of strong gravity and how strong gravity manifests itself in the characteristics of gravitational waveforms. And that is the topic of her plenary today. She's going to discuss with us uh, waveforms for LISA and 3G ground-based detectors. We're delighted to welcome Deirdre as our final plenary speaker. 
Thanks, Martin. And thank you for um, making this after 8 a.m. I think I lucked out here today. <laughs> so uh, that was a very interesting talk in the Event Horizon Telescope. How exciting that is. And so now we're just going to add a second black hole to the equation and um, and see what happens. And so probably the, the topic of waveforms doesn't quite sound quite as sexy as the Event Horizon Telescope. Um, but I hope that you guys will find that this is nonetheless very interesting. So we're going to study, we're going to really dive into the question of, of the role of waveforms um, as we look ahead of LISAN 3G. And because it's LISAN 3G ground-based detectors, uh, I really don't have a lot enough about the very fascinating needs of waveforms for some of the other sources of LISA. And so for that, I apologize. And I have one ask of the audience. And, you know, I thought maybe we could take advantage of this format, which is, you know, we have a way of, of chatting with each other um, non-verbally. So if you, if there, there's no way that I um, got all the papers that should have been cited and all the work that's being done, that is probably of a lot of interest to this community. So if you have a paper you've written or you know of one that I have not um, put in, I encourage you to to go ahead and either type in the chat or the Q&A session so everybody can, can see that interesting work and we can share it. So if you will do that, I would appreciate it. Um, we have to start with the beautiful picture, even if it's not from Lisa <laughs> or uh, any of the ground-based detectors, but here's the famous Stefan's Quintet that came out of James Webb is one of the first pictures we saw. And I think of it as a, you know, one of the ways that we can motivate the general public about how exciting gravitational wave astronomy is already and how exciting it will be as we think about the concept of, of just what our future gravitational wave astronomy might be able to detect, such as black holes in the centers of galaxies merging. So we know that already ground-based gravitational wave detectors excel at detecting binary black holes, which will be my focus, but of course also the very exciting um, mixed compact binaries that include neutron stars. And that will continue as we go to future observatories. And not only that, but um, you know, you think about the, just the incredible opportunities for astronomy and astrophysics that are gonna happen as we, as we move ahead. So my focus is here is on this future, the future challenges that get placed on our waveform work in order to be able to predict and interpret those events. I said the waveforms there, but it's the events. Because if you think about it, oh, that's kind of convenient. You can just fix my own typos as we go. But um, this is this is the focus of this talk, and it's uh, I just want to bring people's attention to the fact that a lot of wonderful things has, have happened, and it and the the way from community is moving with that. And so there's new challenges that arise, but I think everyone's up for that challenge, and it's going to be exciting. So this is a terrible slide, but I just wanted to throw in one where we talk about all these fabulous detectors. So we have, um, of course, the artist illustration of uh, Einstein Telescope, LISA, and Cosmic Explorer. This is the old vision version of the satellite. I should have replaced it with the exciting new images that have come out of LISA. And this is just a discussion of what some of those uh, detectors would look like. And, and I will admit that I don't have PTA involved here because PTA is not something that needs our waveform. So I've sort of ignored PTA, but I just wanted to give it a nod, the pulsar timing array. And you can see from this lower plot down here, uh, just how the strain of these detectors move with frequency. And so we're gonna focus on, on really how the ground-based detection will get broader in frequency and deeper, more sensitive. And of course, how LISA increases its frequency, changes the frequency range completely and what that brings up and how we, we have to address that as people who produce waveforms from theory. So here's just a synopsis of, of what we're looking at. So, you know, the one that I think about most are these massive black hole binaries. And here, this image is from Martin Vendement and company. Um, when we talk about what, what's the landscape, which we'll, we'll dive more into this landscape in a bit. I also wanna bring up intermediate mass ratio. Now, it's always called intermediate mass ratio in spirals, but I would like to tag mergers on there because some of these, depending on their mass range, some of these intermediate mass ratios might merge in band and therefore, you know, especially in the 3G land, 
and really challenge our ability to produce the good waveforms for that regime. That's probably the biggest challenge we have as a community. Uh, and of course, the famous extreme mass ratio in spiral, which I won't talk about and I feel terrible because some of the most interesting stuff I think is coming out of this community. So anyone out there doing MREs, um, please post some of those fascinating papers because this is really great stuff happening. And one of and some a couple of the other things that I think we need to remember as we put all this together is that these black holes aren't not, aren't living in a vacuum space is a vacuum yes but especially as we go towards uh, Lisa's frequency band we have to be prepared for these environmental effects that's why we want to do electromagnetic counterparts in the first place right and of course it is challenging to come up with a way that just gas or accretion around um, a black hole merger event especially for massive black holes, would affect the gravitational waveform. That's hard to do. Nonetheless, we need to prepare that it could happen because what we really don't want to do is um, confuse these two effects, confuse an, an actual classical theory of general relativity with an unexpected, you know, maybe matter component or what have you, or an unusual parameter with a smoking gun signal of an alternate theory of gravity. It's not necessarily that easy to do, but not, we want to be ready to be able to um, distinguish those things. And this is this is the other big challenge we face uh, as waveform community is to do these things and and to do these uh, higher mass ratio in sparks. So if you look at this, we'll talk about it again. But if you look at this plot that I love it that Martin and company did, you can see you can see these three theories: the post-Newtonian theory, the numerical relativity approach, and the gravitational self-force. This is a plot versus compactness versus mass ratio. So you can see how MREs fit in this space: your MRE space, max and min, and then your mass of black holes. So you can see how all of the at the end of the day, we're going to need all of these um, theory landscapes to work together. So this is that plot again, but now pulled out and diving down more into uh, the specifics of what I'll try to talk about. I call it the theoretical landscape. So we just talked about these three, post-Antonian numerical relativity and gravitational self-force. So now I'm just going to talk about that in terms of these binary black holes, right? So when we're in this post-Antonian range, and these boundaries are, are, you know, they look really hard here, but they're not. They depend on what the physical parameters of the black holes are. You can easily imagine that as eccentricity increases, that, that you might, post might not cover as much of the space um, as it would do for an equal mass non-spinning scenario, for example. So post is the best way to approach waveforms uh, that predict, you know, the gravitational radiation emitted by these binaries when the, the two compact objects are far apart and they're moving relatively slow, the compactness isn't crucial. Perturbation or self-force is, is absolutely at its best when the mass ratio is really large so that you can treat this second binary, second black hole, apologies, as a perturbation on the space time of the first. And of course, my world of numerical relativity is when you cannot do either of those approximations and we, we solve the full general relativity equations of motion using numerical methods. And we'll call, I'll call that strong field. Of course, all of this is strong field in someone's vernacular. But uh, when I say strong field, I guess I'm really thinking about when those strong nonlinear effects are, are super important. So that's our theoretical landscape. Um, and as I mentioned, these boundaries aren't clean. And um, so there's some fascinating work coming out of uh, this community, the self-force community that pushes in certain scenarios, the ability to touch numerical relativity. And of course, people have done that between NR and, and post-Antonian as well. I'll only caution that those things tend to be true with sort of minimal parameters, you know, no, either a light spin, no spin, um, no eccentricity. So there's still a lot of work in this space. Nonetheless, really intriguing progress has been made. So we should we should feel good about them. There's a lot of work to do for the future, but we should feel good about it. So why should you care about, about waveforms? Um, you know, sometimes like, don't you guys already know how to solve these equations? Just go at it and give it to us and when we should be good to go. So why should we care? And I think this plot of, of all the fascinating events that ground-based detectors have seen so far is both a reason why people might care or might not care about waveforms in the future. 
So it is true that we have been very successful at providing waveforms that were absolutely crucial for detecting and interpreting gravitational wave events from LIGO, Virgo, and soon Cabra, right? Especially when it came down to these very early, the, the large, big, big massive events, like we didn't expect black holes to be in this mass range. You know, they really are sitting almost purely um, numeric relativity in the, in the band of the ground-based gravitational wave detectors. So, so in some sense, great, we know what we're doing, uh, wonderful. But of course, as things get more sensitive and we, as we change frequency bands or we, and we think about what new signals might populate with new parameters, we, we nonetheless have a new challenge that we have to address. Okay, so what are these changes in the future? I'm bringing back that original plot so we don't introduce too much stuff in the, here. So if we look at this situation, we have, uh, again, the character strain versus frequency. And here we have the potential for Lisa. And here is um, advanced LIGO. And you can imagine, I should have put Cosmic Explorer and Einstein Toolkit, I didn't steal the right plot, would be down here for those future ground-based gravitational wave detectors, deeper, wider. And if we think about what's changing, well, one thing that's changing is that if we look at this, as we go to gravitational wave detectors in this regime, it's not the best color, in this regime, we widen our frequency and we also enter a new frequency band. And of course, um, we end up with more sensitivity, right? So, so if this is going down, we get higher sensitivity. And this is also a, a, a region where we expect to get large signal to noise ratio, especially from the binary black hole mergers. So we are opening up the space a little bit, and that of course is gonna have consequences on our waveforms. So if we look at first that new frequency band and just take Lisa for a second, and this is a very famous plot that shows all, all the fascinating signals that you could potentially see. You know, here are the ones that I haven't, I'm not gonna talk about, which are like Emery's are coming uh, down here. You have all your galactic binary signals here, which is maybe noise to me, but a wonderful astrophysical source to somebody else. You have your stellar mass binaries coming off potentially here. And if we just focus on these supermassive or massive black hole binaries, you know, first thing is of course that the mass range has changed. Now we're talking about supermassive. But the, the other thing that changes is that our expectation of what those parameters could look like. We open up even more than we see with uh, ground base, even though there's a lot of work pushing that we might be seeing eccentric black hole binaries in ground based detectors right now from the stellar mass systems. We of course already mentioned the fact that we expect the higher mass ratios to be potentially more common here, or at least we have to be prepared for that. And there's not a lot of reasons to restrict the spins of two black holes to being aligned or anti-aligned depending on how they were formed. So our typical signal might look a little bit different than it does for ground-based detectors. And of course we want the, the waveforms to be ready to provide that um, prediction from general relativity. Uh, and potentially alternate theories of general relativity. I stole this from Tyson Lindenberg's talk. Uh, it's not so clear because I stole it from his YouTube video. So thanks, Tyson. Uh, but I thought he said it best. You know, if if we Lisa and other 3G detectors are going to see loud signals, then we're just going to see the signal. Why? Why are you going to spend so much time telling us that you have to you have work to do to to better prepare these? Uh, numerical relativity waveforms and the model waveforms. And, and really the beauty is that um, we were gonna have multiple signals, right? Probably in the ground and in space, which, and now these signals won't necessarily all live on top of each other in the same frequency space. So, you know, it's not that confused. However, um, you were likely, and when Tyson talked about this already, you're likely to use something like a global fit that you try to get all of the, uh, events detected kind of together. Um, and so the advantage of doing this rather than one off is that we want to avoid the source confusion I just mentioned. And Tyson didn't seem to think that this was the biggest problem, right? The bigger problem was marginalizing over all model uncertainties. So what you can, what you don't want, what we don't want as, as the theorists producing these uh, predictions of what these events would look like is we don't want 
systematic errors in the models, in the theory, be it post-Newtonian, numeric relativity, self-force, whatnot. We don't want any errors that we have to contaminate this fit. Because you can imagine, as I'll show a plot later, that it could confuse this, the physics underneath and other signals. If you take off a binary black hole signal, it's very loud. Or we can also imagine that you misinterpret a residual as, as something else, some, some either environment or alternate theory. And as, and as Tyson said, it's hard. <laughs> so I'm glad I'm not a data analysis person. I'll let those guys solve that part. But this is just to put in perspective what, what the waveform people are thinking about as we move towards the future. So what are the demands? Well, uh, as I mentioned, the, the frequency range, we add potential sources. I didn't mention this, the length of signal in the band. Um, it is hard. As you go back to that plot I had, you know, we had this plot where you have post-Newtonian, numeric relativity, and cell force. Well, I'm doing it wrong. But anyway, cell force, post-Newtonian, and numeric relativity. Um, NR has a hard time going with a ridiculously number of orbits. At some point, you want post Newtonian to do that instead. So, of course, when you when you add these things up, if you do some kind of hybrid, we also have to worry about the hybridization errors or moving towards a model that can cover the full space, like an EOB or, or a phenom type model. Um, but obviously, you can imagine where those errors could arise if NR can't do 300 orbits and, and you know, if post Newtonian can't get things accurate enough either. I threw in, a, we're not going to talk about this at all, but that's fun. So uh, let's just keep that in mind for the future. The other demand is these hot potential for high signal to noise ratios for the binary black holes. This is, is puts precision chests of GR, not just for Emery's, but actually for more equal mass black hole binaries in the game. Uh, but it means, if, so you can imagine that if our waveforms aren't perfect, which they never will be, but if they're they're fabulous, but not perfect, you're certainly going to detect, you're going to make nice parameter estimation of, of the astrophysical sources that are producing these waves. But if you want to do precision tests of GR, then you're putting a higher demand on the accuracy of these models and, and theoretical predictions, because you don't, you want the every error to be below uh, something you could detect. So you could really look for uh, some, some evidence of a beyond GR theory. So this increases the accuracy necessary for the waveform models. And if you're thinking about the Lisa Red Book, you know, this is this is is what we care about. Can we actually produce the expected uh, signal for Lisa? Well, can we model it? The answer there is probably yes. It's here that is a much harder challenge. And um, of course, the higher suits so noise increases the length of time for computing models and to do data analysis. So every, you know, as we increase orbits as we get more accurate. It's just a larger challenge computationally. And, and you know, we have to remember also that it's going to mean that the data analysis of using these waveforms also could increase in time and we want really efficient. So that's why the speed word is down here, uh, effective models. And the third challenge is, is uh, multiple signals at the same time, whether they're the same or they're actually in the separate frequency bands, they could still cause problems for each other if we don't have a good handle on our systematics. So here's my interpretation of our goal as waveform community. Uh, we wanna ensure the quality of the gravitational wave science is not limited by our capability to solve Einstein's equations. Okay, that's the number one. What does that mean? I already said it, accuracy, parameter coverage, and having a handle on you know, other things, environmental effects beyond GR, et cetera. We also wanna be ready to interpret the unexpected parameters and evidence for beyond GR. So I would say like, if I were prioritizing, I wanna get this done for our section, maybe this is my number one, this is my number two, and then this is my number three goal um, to get, to, to be ready in that, in that order to, um, for when Lisa flies or when Cosmic Explorer or Einstein telescope are on the ground. So how are the NRI model communities addressing these goals? This is just a little plot of the parameter coverage that uh, Deborah Ferguson made uh, using all of the public catalogs. So this is the, we have, we have NR catalogs waveforms that are public, and I don't have the websites up here, but I'll put them up in the chat, uh, that are public for people to use. 
There's SXX, RIT, and Maya. This used to be called Georgia Tech, but I keep moving institutes. <laughs> so, so now we call it the Maya catalog. Um, my team thinks it's very funny. Okay. So in this instance, it's showing you, you know, you have a situation where you have two black holes, they have, you know, a spins associated with them. They have masses obviously associated with them. They could have some eccentricity associated with them. And you can see that as we go through doing numerical relativity, you know, you're at a situation where you're just putting dots on this line. We don't have a smooth functional fit as we cover these parameters. And you can also imagine that if I, if I added something like eccentricity in here, so if I had a mass ratio and I had eccentricity, you would see a lot of points lining up at E equals zero. And of course they would get further apart as Q increased. And then you'd have a lot of points of, of a different eccentricity at this low Q, but you might find very few as you increase eccentricity and find very few as you increase Q. So that's the challenge for us. How do we fill in the space? Do you need the numerical relativity waveforms to directly detect and, and uh, interpret events from gravitational wave detectors? Maybe not. We, off, we use them sometimes, but it's not the priority way but models use them. And so the more densely packed and coverage this parameter space is from numerical relativity, the better, the lower the systematic errors are gonna be from the models. So why is the centric such a big deal? And this is just a whole bunch of uh, papers to read. So sorry about that. Um, you know, at some point we all learned in, in grade school, right? About eccentricity or, you know, simple math about our semi-major and major <laughs> axis, et cetera. So the, the point here is that eccentricity is a Newtonian concept that really doesn't make any sense in general relativity where we're never in a circular, we're never in a closed orbit, right? We're emitting gravitational radiation. So there's oh, there's we're only quasi-circular at our at our best. And actually the NR communities are usually trying to remove eccentricity from their orbits by by modifying you know, the uh, linear momentum that these black holes have when they start, when they're orbiting. Um, so it's hard for us to even have a definition of eccentricity. There's, there's many ways you can define eccentricity, especially when you get really close to merger. So that's a challenge. What definition should we all use so that we are sure that, that when one group says this is the eccentricity, another group has the same notion of eccentricity? Um, of course, it's not just our job. You know, post antonians has been working hard on eccentric PN solutions. Um, there's also been a lot on numerical relativity. You know, we had some really, really early ones, but the problem with NR, if you think about when we do eccentric, if we keep the black holes separated at the same distance, then all we're doing is forming head-on collisions at some point, right? So, it, uh, you know, it's as you increase in centricity, but keep black holes fixed, you're, you're not getting orbits anymore. So there's a challenge to doing this well, and this is the most recent paper out of RIT on eccentric waveforms. There's a numerical relativity surrogate model of eccentric IMR. And when I say IMR, it means the model covers inspro merger and ring down of the system. And there is some interesting work where they did eccentric postnatonian and then hooked it to quasi-circular numerical relativity. So your, your usual numerical relativity uh, waveforms that we've been building for ground-based detectors. So there are some of those. And finally, there are eccentric IMR models coming out of the EOB and Bonham worlds. Um, this, this one I have more details on because Alessandra Bonanno was kind enough to provide it. So I'll show you that a little bit later. So that's an example of eccentricity, which is sort of like the hot parameter to cover these days, where we are in every aspect of that binary black hole model, post numerical relativity, and the model world that brings all these pieces together. So if we want to look a little bit deeper now into accuracy rather than parameters, then what do we want is the question. And I think the answer to that question depends on what problem we're solving. Are we trying to do uh, precision tests of GR? Then it's a hard question. Are we getting the best measurement of parameters we can? Then a, a different question. So when we look at these works, this work here is on the models. This work here was on a, a specific form of numerical relativity error. When we look at that, the big question is, what are we trying to, what problem are we trying to solve? And what metric are we using to measure um, accuracy? 
Is it indistinguishability? Is it a mismatch? You know, that's a kind of still, I think, a little bit of an open question to determine, uh, depending on what question we're trying to solve, which accuracy measurement we should do. This little plot here is just an example that if you use a really high numerical relativity template, and then, you know, as the, as the, um, as the source, as the event, and then use a low resolution template, um, what does it look like that you might leave left in the band? So this is just an example of the residual in light blue of our errors that, that could be there if we don't have a high enough uh, template from numeric relativity. And this is the red one is one if you don't use all the higher modes. So those of you who are really in on, on what um, these waveforms look like from binary black holes, we often talk about them in terms of higher harmonics or modes. So you can see what happened if you only use the dominant versus uh, the rest. So that's just a little appetizer for the type of work people are doing. So this right. is the point where people should fill in. Yeah. Just to say, Deirdre, that's about 25 minutes gone. So five minutes or so would be awesome. Perfect. Um, so I show this slide probably too often. People might be sick of it. Um, and I haven't updated it to the point I want. It was a much more eventful summer than I was expecting. So this is, again, a place where if I haven't cited your paper, I would love to hear what everyone's doing. Um, but if you look at what we've done, if you want to say, all right, uh, what what in the way from space, and this is only for the binary black hole space, my apologies, what do we know? What, what are we working on? You know, I think you should be very confident about, you know, mass ratios. So this Q here is M1 over M2, where M1 is greater than M2. There's a lot of different ways people define that. That's how I'm gonna find it. So, you know, when you're less than about 20 and you have spins, you know, really this is this is high. So less than 0.85 is really the majority of the waveforms in existence, but people push it to higher and um, we're pretty good at it. There are some eccentricities for Q less than 10. They're not that dense yet. So this is still a world that needs work. This is probably a lie. I think the SX group can do more than tens. I don't know if I want to go hundreds, but you know, high, they, you can do several orbits, but not not a thousand uh, by any imagination. And these harmonics again are these higher modes of um, beyond the the quadruple. So what what are we working on? Faster, more efficient codes, so we can achieve these high mass ratios. Uh, looking at accuracy, so how much we have to pour in, and that also comes into these new codes. This is a question I already asked. I'll show you a slide on beyond GR because that's very exciting, but not something I've spent too much time doing. This is another place that's seeing a lot of work right now because as you, as so far all the numeric relativity teams completely agree with each other, but as we get more sensitive signals, you could start maybe to see the differences in our gauge choices and things like that. So we're also aware of that. And also another, you know, if I listed all the choices numerical relativity makes in producing a waveform, and I'm sure a model person could do the same thing, all the choices they make. The big question is, at what point does a different decision between groups show itself in a, as a systematic error? And so these are all the things that we're worrying about to ensure that when, when we're actually getting the data in, you guys can't tell what decisions we've all made, that we all agree. Not all agree because we all make the same choice. Yeah, but I'll agree because our decisions are irrelevant to the capacity of the detectors to make a detection. Um, and here is uh, all the codes that are in existence or in progress. So there's a lot going on in the community. Not all of these are for binary black holes. There's also a lot of work on black hole neutron stars and binary neutron stars. But I hope it gives you a sense of we're using different Different, all these different approaches are important because at the end of the day, we don't want systematic sliding in that we're not aware of. So there's a tremendous amount of work happening in the community. This is a, a slide courtesy of Alessandra on the models. So thank you. Um, this is just for the EOB model. And here what we're seeing is the work that they're doing to improve accuracy and including things like eccentricity. So the modeling community is doing the same thing the numerical relativities community is doing and all the others as we march forward to this future of gravitational wave. So, you know, you want to make sure that as you look at these um, plots, that they are producing this new code, PI, S-E-O-B-N-R, it's a Python code that does faster and more efficient uh, 
waveforms. They're getting more accurate. They're calibrating against the SXX waveforms. But um, you know, this is where, where you need to be careful about your NR errors so that they're not contaminating. And then you can see how well they're doing. They're also doing eccentric black hole binary. So they have, uh, I actually cited this paper earlier on the eccentricity case where you can see the models now including some eccentricity. My only caveat to all these things is that of course there aren't that many NR waveforms that are eccentric. So we have to be, just be knowledgeable as you use all this stuff uh, where we are in the field. For fun, this is almost my last slide. I got this from Calvi Wittek. She gives this beautiful talk on Beyond GR. And this is where that field is. So this slide is here, basically just so you guys can read these papers. I can't really go over it all, um, but you can see all the many ways that people are searching for and trying to get at ways that we could go beyond general relativity and how this might manifest itself in a gravitational wave signal. So there's an incredible amount of work um, and you'll get these slides. So <laughs> you can have fun diving into all this. So what I was trying to do here was link the improving landscape of the detectors to what's happening in the theory world as we prepare to not only detect these events, but interpret them and look for things that we don't expect. So um, everything that improves in the detector space ramps up the challenges in the, in the waveform space. Um, and we want to be cognizant of that and prepared for it, but not doomsayers. So all this is wonderful motivation to do a better job, but we have to remember what we're also very good at, which is detecting these, uh, providing these waveforms. I wanted, I forgot to put in um, the Slack, so I'm going to do it maybe later somehow, but there is an NR community call monthly that's really great. And it also has a Slack channel. And part of that Slack channel is even waveform accuracy. <laughs> so if you're interested in this and haven't yet gotten engaged in the numerical relativity community, let me know and I'll hook you up with all these things that we're doing. Uh, it's a really great community and it's where we talk about a lot of these things uh, to each other. So I think the codes and models that are likely ready for parameters we've seen in the current era, like the, the not too eccentric, the not too crazy uh, mass ratio, et cetera, and you can see that new codes and models, so that means both numerical relativity and the, the waveform models themselves are being built in anticipation of this, this brave new world of, of ground-based 3G and LISA. So it's very exciting, um, and I'm, I'm pretty optimistic about the future. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Deirdre. That was an excellent uh, comprehensive overview that I think struck a good balance between um, appropriate pragmatism and realism and, and, and not too much pessimism about the challenges that lie ahead. Um, but challenges they are, and uh, it's great, great to, to see it all laid out. Um, so let me invite questions from the audience again, as usual, and um, please post them in the Q&A box uh, and you can raise your hand too if you would like to um, ask your question verbally. So we'll give it a yeah, minute to see if some come in. I, I'm, I'm going to ask one. Um, this is our kind of almost um, sort of meta level question, but it's one I've often wondered about. We're accustomed in the gravitational wave field to um, aspects of the instrument science being absolutely at the cutting edge across all of science. Things like, you know, the optical coatings or the vacuum systems and so on. Um, what's your take on, on that when it comes to the um, numerical calculations? You know, are we in the gravitational wave field doing numerical calculations which are as complicated and as challenging as any area of physics? Is that fair or are there other areas of physics that have even tougher challenges than we do? That's a good question. <laughs> you know, I think, I think one of the things that always made our field of numerics hard is that every other area of physics that's doing computational, even of radiation, which in itself is a hard thing to do, is that the, our geometry has to be solved for at the same time. Everybody yeah. else is on a Newtonian playing field. Their geometry is given. So they're just solving the equations for that dynamics. But we're solving the equations for the, the actual geometry, the space time itself as we do the dynamics. And that adds you know, at the level of, to be pedestrian, it just adds more equations to solve yeah. <laughs> more variables to have. Now, the vacuum case, 
is easier than the case of adding matter to that. So, so obviously if you're doing two neutron stars and you're trying to add every physics possible that's inside a neutron star, um, now that is mind blowingly, you know, I don't, we don't even add it all yet, right? That's so hard. So I, I don't think there's too much harder than that, but there are probably people solving uh, larger systems. Okay, I'll, I'll take that. Um, so in the box, there's a question from the other D Shoemaker. Uh, yeah. It says, I don't think I heard you say that there's a big challenge to provide good waveforms meeting the goals for interpretation in the mid 2030s. Is that correct? Um, I was very careful not to say <laughs> because I don't know. I, I think the problem is, is that I, I, if I look at what the Lisa proposal promised in terms of what type of signals you want to detect and the accuracy range of those parameters, we are right now trying to make sure that we can check all those boxes. So I didn't see anything in that proposal. It was like, oh, you have to measure a, a mass ratio of, of 100 to a mass error of you know, 1%. That I don't think we could do. So, so that's why I, I was trying to be very careful here to say, I, it's not that I don't think we can achieve some of the things laid out in that proposal. I think we, we probably can, even today's votes but we haven't proven it. Like I would prefer the community to put out a paper that very carefully says, this is where we are. Um, but for future, I, we know some things that we can't do that well. And that's the thing you see all these new codes and everything pivot towards, which is the, the, the space that, that is more challenging, like the really the separate masses um, and really super high spins, like 0.9999, you know, of Kerr, things like that, where we know we have uh, a challenge ahead of us. Yeah. Especially, and then, then the second caveat of that would be how good can we test GR? Now we have to go back to the signal space that we said we were quite good at and ask ourselves if you're not asking astrophysics, but you're asking it from a, a testing gravity perspective, are we good enough? And I think that's a separate category that is, I'm uncertain of how good we are. Thanks, Deirdre. Kelly also has a question. Yeah, Kelly's posed a question. Well, I, I can relay it, but of course you can read it yourself. What way do you <laughs> verify that the Q128 runs are correct not to be uh, picking on that particular study, um, but it's in a relatively new frontier? And then she adds, ha, relatively, OMG, I am hilarious. <laughs> and Kelly often is very fun. <laughs> 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 and thank you for having a laugh. Um, yeah, so, so this is why you know, I know a lot of the model waveforms just use SXX waveforms and call it a day. And, you know, I'm not going to criticize that. I'm just going to say that at some point, you know, we can always do internal tests. Like, let's take that 128 run. That's actually RIT. Um, you can do a convergence test. It's really hard because if you if the best, if the hardest waveform you can produce is that, then it, then you probably can't do a high resolution version of it because you would just increase the mass ratio instead of playing with that uh, resolution. So it gets very hard to test the absolute corners, the frontiers of our parameter space. So you either want two groups to do it, having made different decisions so that they can compare, or you want the group who has it to have done a convergence test, which means they're changing out their resolution. There are other differences though in numerics, not just resolution that can cause error. So I think at the end of the day, if you ask the NR community, we all would like to see multiple codes be able to produce a similar signal so we can always check that way. That would just make us all more confident. Thanks. But it's a great piece of work. They've also pushed the eccentricity boundary, you know, so it's great to have like things pushed and then we can all sort of say, all right, where are we? Is this correct? Yeah. Okay, probably time for one more question. Is there anything people would like to ask? Martin, can I just... Uh ask Deirdre's permission to post our email address into the program uh, so that people can pass on any questions or papers. Yeah, or, sure. Excellent. Okay, thank you. Um, well, I think with that, given that there'll be the chance for people to send any follow on comments or questions, then we'll move on because we, we did start a few minutes late, but let's try and keep to schedule. So let's thank uh, both of our speakers again, uh, Ferial and Deirdre. And we're about to now begin a 15 minute break um, after which we will have our panel discussion. So we'll uh, resume just after 15.35 or 16.35 Central European time and try and be back for 16.35 and that will give us 
um, a, a chance to remain on schedule for our final um, part of the session. So enjoy the coffee break and we'll see you in about 15 minutes. Hey everyone, this is John. Can you guys hear me? Checking audio. I can hear you, John. Okay, great. Um, okay, Natalia, Alessandra, Victor, Christopher, just making sure we're all here. John, can you and, hear me well? I can hear you just fine, yeah. Hi, oh, great. Hey, Vitor. Hey. Good morning or good afternoon? Good afternoon. <laughs> Hello. Hey, hi, good afternoon. Do you hear also me well? I hear you just fine, Alessandra. Okay, hi, everyone. Yeah, Alistair hey, Alessandra, just checked out. Oh, go ahead, John. I just had a, had a question for Alessandra. So on the charts here, um, we have one chart on each of the observatories, and then there's a slide that's a summary of future concepts. 
And then there's a couple of charts after that. Alessandra, were you going to talk to the, the last couple of charts? Uh, yeah, so I was I put uh, two slides uh, which are very quick, however, as you have seen, and I was planning to uh, to talk about that. Um, is that the, your question about? Is what yeah, you okay, were asking? Yeah, the chart. Yeah, can, yeah, can yeah. Can you yeah. see the chart? Uh, oh, okay. Um, uh, so yeah, so I was going to just give an introduction with this chart here, and then pass it along to each of the speakers, and we were planning to put this chart. Um, just leave this chart up for discussion since it, since it is a summary. Um, and so I think after this one, I will skip this and then hand it off to you, Alessandra, to go last. Ah, you want to put uh, the one of the uh, the previous one as the last one. Is this what you are yeah, asking? That's right. Yeah, you can just move that's actually right. that last one. Okay. But that uh, so I will not discuss. <laughs> you will leave it. So these last two charts are yours, Alessandra, this one and this one? Yes, this, yeah. And then the one of the noise cards, uh, you will take over at that point. Yes, uh, that, that will just stay up while we do the question and answer. Okay, that, I will rearrange the charts quickly then. Be done. Okay, that all looks good. Um, I just wanted to make a brief apology. I think I had a slightly wrong link up for Irina's uh, paper on the website, but I have replaced that earlier this morning. Um, I think I had a link to a presentation on uh, the, the white paper rather than the paper, but that's now corrected on the um, in the program and on the Lisa Symposium website. Does everyone see the chart in the full screen mode like this? Yeah. Yeah, that's clear. Great. I think John Martin will do an introduction of you and, and the panel first, and then you bring up your 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 um, slides, if that's okay. Well, I wasn't going oh, to introduce. Yeah. Oh, you were not okay. Um, Sorry, Martin. Because, no, 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 not at all. But I, I I guess I would just say hi to everyone, welcome them back, and then hand on to John. 
And then, John, I think it's probably best that you introduce the panel. Would, would that work? Because I know you've been gathering some sentences from people. Is it okay yeah, that he keeps up his slides, plan. Martin? I, I have introductory lines for each of the panels. Right, Grant. Well, I think since the slide's already being shared, we'll just stick with that. But I'll just switch my camera on so that people see me. And then um, I, I'll, I'll just you know basically do the handover to John. So I'll put my camera on now, in fact, but we've still got a minute or two before we resume. So welcome back everyone. Uh, we're just about at the point where the schedule says we should be beginning. Uh, I appreciate we did begin coffee a few minutes late. So I will speak for a moment or two to allow more to rejoin, hopefully suitably refreshed. Um, we had a very nice plenary from Jonah Canner last night on the last mile problem. So we're kind of into the last mile now in the LISA symposium, but I don't think it will be a problem. On the contrary, I think it will be a very interesting discussion on Beyond Lisa and the Voyage 2050 panel. And to convene that panel, and indeed to introduce them, I'm delighted to hand over to John Conklin from the University of Florida, Gainesville. So over to you, John. Thanks, Martin. Uh, and welcome to the last session of the 14th uh, Lisa Symposium. Uh, as Martin says, this is a, a discussion of what might come next after uh, the Lisa mission. Uh, and this is centered on the, the European Voyage 2050 uh, activity that was um, uh, managed by ESA. So as you probably are aware, there were a number of concept uh, white papers that were submitted um, uh, to Voyage 2050. And what we're going to do here is hear from some of the, the uh, people who um, led those efforts. We're going to uh, discuss each of those um, uh, mission concepts briefly. And then after that, what we'd like to really do is open it up for discussion. So we're going to take maybe the first 15 or 20 minutes um, just summarizing briefly the concepts um, and then a, a summary of the um, Voyage 2050 activity itself um, at the end. Uh, and then we'll open it up for discussion. So here you see a list of the panelists. And this is also the order in which we will proceed um, through these activities. Um, first, we have Natalia Korsakova, and I'd like to just say a few words introducing each of the panelists um, before they, they speak. So she's a postdoc at APC in Paris. Um, she did her PhD at the Albert Einstein Institute in Hanover, working on LISA Pathfinder, uh, mainly focusing on uh, LISA data analysis um, and uh, working on speeding up parameter estimation and, and separation of the various signals for the LISA mission uh, itself. Uh, she was the co-chair of the white paper called Unveiling the Gravitational Universe at Microhertz Frequencies. And with that, I will hand it over to uh, Natalia. Uh, hello. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, so we'll start in the low frequency band. Um, so with our proposal, uh, we were thinking about uh, the concept where we can cover the frequencies between LISA and PTA. And uh, therefore, we were thinking of the concept where we can uh, have uh, longer arms than LISA. And this, uh, this uh, led us to the sort of straw man mission that will have a heliocentric constellation of satellites. And um, now I will briefly introduce some uh, signs that you can have uh, with this sort of uh, experiment. Uh, it, it won't cover, my short introduction won't cover everything, but just maybe highlight some important things. Uh, so first, because we will be sensitive, uh, more sensitive in the lower frequencies, uh, we would be able to observe a lot of massive black hole binaries, and we would be able to observe very massive uh, binaries. Therefore, uh, we would understand, um, we can understand uh, the uh, emergence of the high redshift quasars because we see uh, these quasars at the redshifts up to seven, 
and to understand the way they form, uh, we have to observe them not only electromagnetic spectrum, but we can we have to observe the other mechanisms as mergers for these uh, systems. In addition to that, the ability of observing uh, many massive black hole binaries uh, of the order of 10 to 3 uh, would allow us to study the formation scenarios in general for all redshifts. And for the small redshifts, we would be able to see the population of uh, the massive black hole binaries from the dwarf galaxies. And uh, because in these galaxies, um, uh, there is not so much matter, um, so this um, um, these sources, uh, they have a very, uh, they keep uh, uh, the memory of the initial seeding process. And, uh, but the, the merger rates are not very high. So with LISA probably we won't be able to see them. Uh, but with, uh, with a lower frequency detector, we might observe the in spiral phase. Uh, at the same time for the um, uh, we would be able to do the multi-messenger astronomy uh, because uh, we would be able to observe massive local binaries for a really long time and we can study the evolution of uh, uh, the binary and the galaxy together so we can study the the simultaneously the signal in the electromagnetic spectrum uh, the evolving signal in the electromagnetic spectrum and in the gravitational spectrum and also we can uh, have a quite good localization because we are going to observe them for a really long time. Uh, <clears throat> in addition to that, we can do the cosmology and cosmography. We can in investigate QCD phase transitions and we can observe uh, uh, a lot of uh, uh, massive local mergers with electromagnetic counterparts, which would allow us to constrain deviations from CDM. Um, uh, in addition to that, uh, we can do some studies in the Milky Way. Uh, one of the important things that we can do, uh, which cannot be done with LISA, is that we can understand the common envelope physics. Um, and this can be done by observing the, uh, the evolution of the compact object uh, and the uh, main sequence star binaries. And we would be also able to see the uh, we predict that that we can see the signals uh, from the uh, from the inspiring compact objects or uh, the the main sequence star around the galactic center. And last but not the least, uh, we can also improve uh, the the uh, the tests of GR up to uh, two orders of magnitude uh, compared to LISA. And we can directly observe memory effects, uh, which would give us the, uh, the direct uh, test of GR in the strong regime. Uh, okay. That is it. <laughs> Thanks, Natalia. So as uh, uh, Natalia sort of indicated, we are organizing this by frequency. So we are starting at the microhertz range and we will work our way up. Um, and next up, we have uh, Vitor Cardoso, who is a professor of physics um, in, at the Technico in Lisbon and also at the Niels Bohr Institute. Um, Vitor did his PhD in Lisbon on black hole spectroscopy, gravitational wave physics, and he's interested in gravitation at large with a focus on the strong field regime. Uh, he was the co-chair of the white paper probing the nature of black holes deep in the millihertz gravitational wave sky. Peter, go ahead. Thank you, John. Can you hear me well? I hear you just fine, yeah. Perfect. Hi, all. It's a uh, great pleasure to, to be here in the uh, closure of this uh, very interesting meeting. So I'll spend a, a couple of minutes talking about our uh, Voyage 2050 proposal, and that was focused on the, uh, on the nature of black holes. The, uh, the proposed instrument was Amigo. It's a, a detector in the, uh, uh, in the millihertz band, and you can see the, uh, the sensitivity curve, well, the proposed sensitivity curve in the, uh, in the top uh, plot. Uh, it's basically focused in the millihertz band, and amigo, by the way, means uh, friend in Portuguese and Spanish. I'm sure we can find something in order that it also stands for some acronym, or some technical uh, term. 
So details about the instrument and the science, you can find them in the imprint on the uh, top of the page. Amigo is basically an announced version of Lisa that would improve its millihertz sensitivity by roughly a factor of 10 across all of the uh, millihertz band. I will not deal with the uh, technological hurdles because I'm not qualified to discuss them. Uh, uh, but let me say a few words about the science. So as I said, the focus was on the discovery potential of black holes. And if you think about it, there's that it's a strong motivation uh, to build a new instrument because that's where new physics is supposed to reside. We don't understand black hole interiors. So there's good reasons to think there's that the, there's new stuff coming out of strong field regions. Now, Amigo can see ring down with an unprecedented accuracy, so relaxation of black holes. And that means that it's going to see the quadrupolar, the octopolar, and higher order modes uh, very clearly, as you can see in the bottom plot. You can estimate, so once you know, uh, once you measure, uh, you know, the characteristic frequencies from these modes, you can also, you can uh, go backwards and estimate mass and spin of the of the remnant with an, uh, an amazing accuracy. So Amigo would do this to levels of 10 to the minus five if the remnant is close enough. But it, of course, you can also use it to perform spectroscopy tests of general relativity, uh, you know, amazing new tests, and of course, to improve source location because you have a large number of very loud modes. And because one sees ring down so clearly, any possible post-merger signal uh, arising from new physics would also stand out. And in practice, this would mean that you can rule out structure uh, that's a Planck distance away from the horizon, you know, at least for all of the conservative models we know of. And that's an amazing statement, right? You're probing, uh, let's say, quantum uh, scales with gravitational wave detectors. Now, with this beautiful instrument, you can also monitor how the spiral proceeds. And so if you have any additional interaction or a, a new radiative channel, that would change the dynamics. Uh, and Amigo would see that. So for example, different multipolar structure for the uh, inspiraling objects or different tidal properties, different from general relativity, they will all leave detectable imprints in the waveform. For example, just to give you a very concrete example, Amigo would be able to constrain the electromagnetic charge in the spiraling components to the level of one electron in excess over 10 to the 23 nucleons, right? So we would test neutrality of black holes or of matter to one part in 10 to the 23, at least in this way of phrasing things. And this also means that extensions of general relativity will be tightly constrained by Amigo and possibly uh, we're going to find new physics with this. Now, the new physics can, can come in the form of weak couplings uh, to the standard model, in which case, then gravity really is going to be the preferred way to test it. Uh, if you take, for example, new fundamental fields, like a new scalar field or a vector field, which doesn't couple to matter, it still sees gravity. And we know that it, this, this type of fields extract rotational energy away from spinning black holes. This is going to show up in a stochastic background or a resolvable source of continuous waves or simply as gaps in the uh, mass spin distribution. So Amigo would be a unique probe of new fields across five orders of magnitude. So we're talking about the particle detector on the sky and it's a very nice complement to earth-based detectors since we're talking about different scales, so different physics. Now, a fraction of the sources that we're going to see with Amigo are extreme mass ratio systems. And so Amigo would be able to probe the geometry of supermassive black holes up to large redshifts, Z equals uh, seven to 10, while getting information in the electromagnetic spectrum if these systems are in AGNs. And so with this type of sensitivity, Amigo would allow us to learn about the Christian physics and even possibly dark matter spikes if they're dense enough or the nature of dense stellar environments, provided of course we understand how to model these systems. Amigo will also be able to see in spiraling white dwarfs late in the process or during merger, 
allowing for follow-up electromagnetic observations. And this can hopefully shed some light on the origin of uh, type 1a supernovae. And if we have good sensitivity at slightly lower frequencies, look at the top panel, then we can even study the dynamics of stars around Sagittarius A, as Natalia was telling us. And this will make a very nice point of contact with very large baseline interferometry, event horizon telescope or gravity, and possibly help to constrain the evolution of our own galaxy. Thank you. Okay, hey, thanks, Peter. Um, so moving along, next we have Christopher Berry uh, from the uh, Institute of Gravitational Research at the University of Glasgow, where we all are currently virtually located for this meeting. Um, uh, Christopher completed his PhD on LISA-related science, uh, looking in particular at extreme mass ratio uh, systems. After uh, his PhD, he switched to be primarily focused on the LIGO Virgo Cagra data analysis and how to infer the properties of population of compact binaries and astrophysical processes that shape uh, their evolution. He was co-chair of the white paper, The Missing Link in Gravitational Wave Astronomy, discovering discoveries waiting in the decihertz range. Christopher? Uh, thank you, John. Uh, it's a pleasure to be able to speak about this. Um, so yes, we in our white paper looked at the, the decihertz range, so moving up now uh, to the frequency range between LISA and the ground-based detectors. Now there's actually been a, a whole range of different mission concepts which touch upon various aspects of this frequency range. Uh, so at the bottom of this slide here is a, a selection of these, and indeed we had some uh, presentations earlier today in the parallel sessions on updates on a, a couple of these uh, concepts here. So there, there's a wide range of, of different uh, technologies which could potentially uh, examine this frequency range. Uh, for the white paper, we, we put together a couple of uh, strawman designs based on uh, LISA technology to try and evaluate what, what you could see. Uh, in this frequency range, there are a whole range of sources you can see in this um, figure to the side, uh, various types of binaries illustrated and some uh, supernova uh, signals. And uh, in these few minutes here, I'd just like to highlight three science themes, uh, which I think are, are particularly exciting in the, the Dusty Hertz range. So first up would be stellar mass binaries. These are the gravitational wave sources we know are there thanks to the, the ground-based detector network. So potentially we will be able to have multi-band observations of uh, binary black holes, neutron star black holes, uh, binary neutron stars which is particularly exciting uh, if we can get the same observation in both the um, decihertz range and with the ground-based detectors, as we can combine these observations together to get improved constraints on the, of the properties of these sources. We can additionally provide early warning of uh, mergers of these systems, uh, particularly important for the case of uh, binary neutron stars, um, where um, that we expect an electromagnetic counterpart, so you can potentially get your um, observer friends all lined up and, and ready uh, well ahead of time to see what's going on. Now, it is possible to do some uh, multiband observations with, with LISA, uh, but the detection horizon is quite limited here. So with decihertz, you can push that back. And with the, the most sensitive mission concepts potentially um, matched what the third generation ground-based detectors, Cosmic Explorer or Einstein Telescope could do, in terms of seeing how these systems evolve across cosmic time. So we'll be able to see the properties of these sources evolve uh, with the universe and use this to understand their observations, uh, so their, their evolution, uh, the astrophysics of them uh, more. Um, in addition to seeing the types of binaries we can see with the ground-based detectors, we'll also be able to see white dwarf binaries. Now these merge at frequencies before they hit the ground-based range, uh, but with decihertz we'll be able to see them, so we'll be able to have um, some information on the properties of these systems, and these are also uh, exciting because there will um, be electromagnetic counterparts to these, uh, potentially type 1a supernova, uh, so we'll have a, a new multi-messenger source potentially there. An additional advantage of seeing binaries earlier in the evolution uh, is that we will be able to measure orbital eccentricity easier. Um, eccentricity is, is radiated away by gravitational waves, so orbits circularize. However, eccentricity is a key tracer of the formation of compact binaries. So if we want to uh, 
stand a better chance of distangling, say, dynamical formation of binary black holes in globular clusters versus isolated evolution in the field or various other channels going on. Uh, information on eccentricity is very helpful, and so going to lower frequency will provide new insights here. And so that's um, particularly exciting, I think, for the decihertz science. Now, as we're at lower frequencies than the ground-based detectors, we can go to, to lower masses as well. And really, the decihertz is perfectly suited to intermediate mass black holes. So black holes of uh, 100 solar masses up to maybe 10 to the 4 solar masses or so before we get to the, the massive black holes, which are really um, what LISA is optimal for. So we'll be able to see intermediate mass black hole binaries, so two of these orbiting each other, and do all the, the usual physics that we like to do with merging binary black holes, measure their masses and spins, use that to infer uh, how they form, see how these evolve across cosmic time, use them for uh, tests of general relativity and so on. So uh, intermediate mass black hole binaries, uh, we, can, we can see those uh, perfectly in the decihertz. We can also see intermediate mass ratio in spirals. So if we have a stellar mass object and uh, an intermediate mass black hole, we expect that these might be the sort of things that form in globular clusters. Maybe there's one intermediate mass black hole that forms at the center of a cluster. We'd expect it to, to form binaries as, as objects get close. Um, so we'll be able to, to measure these, um, then learn something about the dynamics in the center of these clusters. Um, and uh, additionally, if we have white dwarfs, those could be tidally disrupted and we can maybe have an electromagnetic counterpart here. So looking at these intermediate mass um, black holes, we'll be able to, to study their, uh, their properties and hopefully figure out if there is a, a real connection between the, the black holes seen in the ground-based detectors um, and the massive black holes seen by, by LISA. Is there one continuum? Do we merge? Uh, smaller black holes up to bigger ones? Is there a difference in the formation mechanism? Do the center of galaxies um, form things in a different way? Or we'll be able to fill in the mass continuum, see if there's one continuous thread of evolution. If there's a break, where that break is, where's the upper limit, where's the lower limit of these uh, black holes? Okay, so um, intermediate mass black holes, perfect in the dusty Hertz range. As mentioned uh, by the others earlier, each time we go to a new uh, frequency range of, of gravitational waves, uh, we open up the, the possibility of seeing new physics. Um, so uh, we can, of course, do tests of general relativity in, in a, a new uh, frequency range, see if anything is uh, deviation in, in the waveform. Uh, actually, the, the intermediate mass uh, ratio in spirals might be quite useful here because they're in the region between uh, sort of perturbation cell force approach of, of uh, extreme mass ratio in spirals and the uh, regime where we know numerical relativity works quite well with the equal mass binaries. So it's a good, good range for testing our waveforms as well as uh, sources of physics. Um, we can potentially search for uh, stochastic backgrounds. Uh, some quite high energy uh, backgrounds might potentially be seen uh, if we have first order phase transitions in the early universe in the Dusty Hertz range. And of course, we can uh, maybe uh, place constraints on uh, cosmic strings and the, the energies of those based on what we do or do not see. Additionally, we can look for um, uh, additional beyond standard model particles from uh, super radiances around black holes. The energy scale of these particles uh, scales with the uh, mass of the black holes. So here we're best suited to intermediate mass black holes, which is something like uh, 10 to the minus 14 electron volts. Um, which is, you know, what is, is specific to this range. Um, so um, potentially putting all these together, um, you know, we, we can do the science that we know we can do with stellar mass black holes because we're doing it already. We can uh, fill in the gap between the, the Lisa black holes and the ground-based black holes with the intermediate black, black holes. And then uh, more speculatively, there's hopefully some new physics uh, that we can either observe or constrain from these observations. Um, so I'll wrap up there and hopefully there'll be some good questions. Thanks, Christopher. Uh, very nice. Um, next up, uh, continuing in this frequency band, we have uh, Irina Dvorkin. She's from the IAP in Paris. Um, she's interested in the formation and evolution of compact binaries um, and their uh, galactic environments. Um, and in the context of LISA science, she focuses on stochastic backgrounds produced by astrophysical sources. Uh, and she was the co-chair of the white paper titled High Angular Resolution Gravitational Wave Astronomy. Irina? 
Hi, uh, yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. Uh, thanks, John, for the introduction. And um, so it's a, it's a great pleasure to, uh, to introduce our white paper here. So indeed, I'm going to continue uh, in the same frequency range as Christopher. So this proposal sort of builds up on the decahertz uh, detector. So here we thought about ways to, to drastically improve the angle resolution of our observations. Uh, and to try to reach, um, to reach really arc minute resolution for individual sources. So for this, we uh, work, we basically need a very long baseline for observations. So we mentioned putting two decahertz detectors in orbit, uh, as is shown in the cartoon here on the slide. Uh, this will practically probably necessitate the collaboration of uh, several space agencies. Um, but um, this is, this seems, to us, uh, definitely a possible way forward. Uh, but uh, in any case, just focusing on the science uh, returns from this rather than the um, technical issues, what these, uh, these detectors would allow us, so we have two decibels detectors with roughly AU separation between them, we uh, will achieve an arc minute astrometric resolution for individual sources and about a degree resolution of our stochastic signal, so the degree resolution of our uh, stochastic gravitational wave backgrounds. Uh, and so there are many, many applications. So basically imagine all this great science that Christopher just described, but also adding up this, this, uh, this angle resolution aspect would allow us to go much further. So here's just a few examples. Um, and I encourage you to look into uh, the white paper to see uh, more, uh, more ideas. But um, for example, what we could do is to, uh, is really precision cosmography with standard sirens. So both bright uh, sirens with blue electromagnetic counter counterparts like uh, uh, binary neutron stars, but also dark sir sirens like, so binary black holes. Here I'm talking about stellar uh, mass objects. So this angle resolution would allow us to identify the uh, the, the, the galaxies uh, in, and so the redshifts of all binary neutron stars that we'll observe, or virtually all of them, and also a lot of the binary black holes, because the error box will be so small that even for binary black holes, the it will contain only maybe a few tens or a few hundreds of galaxies. And so just by the, the statistical methods that are already developed now for these dark sirens will allow us to, to have a very precise measurements or other precise measurements of the redshift. So we'll be able to construct a Hubble diagram with 10 to the five to 10 to the six sources. And so uh, what, just an example that you can see here on uh, like on the, on the plot here on the slide, this will allow to constrain the Hubble parameter and the uh, amplitude also on the axis and the amplitude of the primordial density fluctuations on the Y axis to uh, fantastic precision. So if you if you just look at the at the at the red uh, at the red ellipse, which it was obtained using just these cosmography methods. Uh, well, I'm not going to go into details, but it uses both the luminosity distance and also weak lensing uh, effects. Um, so another uh, application of this high angle resolution concept is to um, is, is to is to identify uh, massive black hole binaries way before the merger itself, weeks to months before the merger. Now this will allow to uh, to follow, to conduct electromagnetic observations of these systems before the merger. And so to see uh, the, 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 the structure of the accretion disk for the environment of this of the sources, which will probably show other modulations of the signal uh, with the more orbital period or other effects depending on the environment. And this is something that is for, the, for, for, for which it is crucial to achieve, to achieve very, very high resolution uh, of the, uh, of the source, of the, of the, of this uh, anchor resolution of the source to identify it exactly know where to, to follow up. So the, the, the current of the, uh, the, the, the environments of this, of the system are not really uh, resolved and so not known. So uh, there is a lot of, uh, of work to do on the, on the structure of this, uh, of uh, accretion disk of AGMs of uh, of uh, embryos and um, and, uh, and 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 uh, other such systems. Uh, so these uh, both this uh, these topics that I mentioned, uh, so standard sirens and also massive black hole binaries, uh, is also related to the constraints that we can place on modified gravity theories by identifying the uh, the the sources and the redshifts of the sources 
you can put uh, really exquisite constraints on the propagation speed uh, of, uh, of, of the gravitational waves, uh, uh, on the polarization of gravitational waves. Uh, and, and so this will be really allow us to place much, much more stringent constraints on, uh, on modified gravity theories and fundamental physics. So for this, again, it's crucial to, to identify to identify the sources of the, the host galaxies of our uh, gravitational wave events. Uh, and then finally, uh, going to stochastic signals. Um, so we know that both astrophysical and cosmological signals, uh, uh, cosmological stochastic signals have an anisotropic component. So we have astrophysical sources, uh, uh, the, the binaries, uh, uh, the, the, the emeries, uh, they live in galaxies and so they would, they obviously present an anisotropic structure, whereas the cosmological signals, uh, so signals from the early universe, uh, from cosmic strings, from first order phase transitions, uh, also can present anisotropic component. And now identifying this anisotropic component is extremely challenging. It will be extremely challenging with LISA. And so going beyond that and allowing to, uh, to reach multiples of uh, a few hundreds to a thousand will really allow us to study, study these, uh, these backgrounds, uh, to identify them, to, um, to distinguish between them and to do cross correlations with a large scale structure. Uh, so, uh, so this, uh, yeah, uh, this, uh, this is all for me and, uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Irina. Uh, very nice summary there. Um, last but not least, we have, uh, Alessandra Bonanno. She is the director of the Max Planck Institute for Gravitational Physics in uh, Potsdam, Germany. And she's interested in predicting high precision gravitational waves uh, from compact object binary systems to probe gravity, black holes, and fundamental physics. And she was a member of the senior committee, uh, which was established by ESA, uh, director of science, to make a recommendation on the science themes for the next three large missions that, that are part of the Voyage 2050 program. And that is what she's going to talk about now. Alessandra? Uh, yes, uh, thank you for the introduction, John. Um, so uh, just a couple of minutes. Uh, in June of last year, uh, the ESA Directors of Science and uh, the Science Program Committee announced uh, the next science program for Voyage 2050 based on the uh, study that was done and the recommendation that came from the senior committee after analyzing, studying uh, uh, the white papers that were submitted uh, in the summer of 2019, and uh, selecting uh, three teams, the moons of giant uh, planets, uh, from temperate exoplanets to the Milky Way, and then the new physical probes of the early universe. And here I just uh, uh, wrote a couple of uh, paragraphs from uh, uh, the report of the senior committee concerning uh, the third team um, for which uh, um, the, um, the team should be addressed either with gravitational wave detectors or precision microwave spectrometers uh, to explore the early universe, say redshift larger than seven or eight. And the mission should uh, shed light on uh, outstanding question in fundamental physics, astrophysics, uh, for example, uh, initial cosmic, uh, uh, how the initial cosmic structures grew, uh, how the first black hole formed, how supermassive black holes came to exist. And I want also to emphasize that while the focus of this large mission dedicated to the early universe, um, uh, you know, should be a redshift larger than eight, however, uh, should also accomplish significant science uh, at lower redshifts. So next page, uh, John. Uh, this is just, okay. Uh, a plot that shows the evolution of the universe and just emphasizing in the red box uh, the region with redshift, let's say, larger than seven and eight. And so I want to also just to um, conclude by saying that the ESA is establishing the uh, expert study committees for each of the three teams. In fact, uh, the call for the moons of the giant planets uh, 
which is supposed to be the first mission that goes is already out. And the one for the new physical probes of the early universe may come out sometime in 2024. And then the call for missions for the team of the new physical probes of the early universe uh, should take place sometime in 2030, um, more likely mid late 2030s. That's all. Okay, hey, thanks, Alessandra. So we have um, here just a, a summary chart uh, summarizing the, the concepts that were just discussed uh, in, in the, uh, the sensitivity bands. Uh, and also we can see uh, Lisa sitting here. Uh, we do have a couple of questions from the audience already. Um, let's see, the two I see here are for uh, DeSigo actually. The first question uh, from uh, Thomas Cooper is, um, what is the volume uh, DeSigo can test for a typical white dwarf merger? Uh, only galactic sources or even beyond the local volume? Hey, so uh, I, I guess I should take that. I, I should stress that I'm, yeah. I'm uh, not representing DeSigo as in the, the Japanese mission, which is um, you know, quite quite well studied. Um, we, we were just looking more generally at, at decihertz observatories. And the missions we considered were, were slightly less ambitious than DeSigo. We didn't have the, the cavities in the arms. Um, for, for ours, I, uh, yeah, we could see outside the, the Milky Way. So I, I think something like the, the Virgo cluster is what we could see. Um, with actual DeSigo, you could you could see further, so potentially uh, to places where redshift is, is not entirely negligible. Um, so there's certainly some exciting things one could do uh, with looking at white dwarfs outside the galaxy, um, and um, maybe in, in the more with the more sensitive detector, actually um, see something with some some redshift evolution, which would be um, very exciting. Anyone else want to comment on that? I think that was likely directed at Christopher, but just in case anyone else has a comment. Okay, I think the next question may also be for you, uh, Christopher. This is coming from uh, Sarah Gosan. Um, it was mentioned that wave dwarf binaries might have a type 1a supernova counterpart. It is thought, as far as I know, that only a subset of white dwarf binaries, dependent on uh, the white dwarf composition, could have a type 1a counterpart at merger. Are there any tidal signatures in the in-spiral that could be used to probe white dwarf composition and consequently um, preferentially find specific white dwarf, white dwarf binaries more likely uh, to go uh, type 1a supernova? Yeah, I think this is a fantastic question, Sarah. Um, I would really like to know the answer. So it's, it's not been studied in sufficient detail for me to, to say what the answer is. I think um, if we have a detector that's sensitive enough, we should be able to measure the tidal distortion of the white dwarfs, and that would give us some information on the structure. Uh, how much you could you measure would depend on the signal to noise ratio, and so how close the source is, how sensitive your detector is, and so on. So in theory, I think there would be some, some information from that about the structure of the white dwarfs. Um, equally, if we um, just going to the other source I mentioned of a white dwarf in an intermediate mass black hole. Uh, potentially we'll see that being tightly disrupted and, and maybe we'll be able to, to see something about the structure from the end part of, of that signal. Um, so I think there's some information there, but I have no idea about how that would map to actually understanding the structure of the white dwarf. So how one goes from, from tidal measurements to actually um, testing different different compositions. Uh, so I'd be, um, yeah, I'd love to see some some detailed results on that, um, if anyone uh, fancies taking that on in the future. Thanks, Christopher. Uh, do any of the other panels have any comments on that uh, question? Seems like no. Uh, we have another one here from uh, David Shoemaker. Um, he wants to put in a vote for uh, decihertz detectors, both for looking at the missing window in the middle and for potential uh, for the potential cosmological background. Okay, thanks, David. But he also has a question. He says now, but for my question, how can we get NASA engaged uh, in this as a collaborator? That that is a a great question. Do any of the panelists have thoughts? Um, I could chime in myself as the uh, U.S. representatives here on the panel. Um, yeah, Christopher is saying yes. So that's 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 a great question. I, um, you know, 
as you know, David, there was not um, much at all said in uh, the last decadal uh, survey, ASTRO 2020, about um, gravitational wave observatories beyond LISA. Of course, there was a, a, a very nice um, endorsement uh, for LISA itself. Um, and you know, just personally, that was a bit of a disappointment, and in particular, with respect to um, doing technology development for what might come uh, after LISA. Um, so, of course, there's looking to the next decadal. That's, that's 10 years out. Um, that seems like a long time. Um, but I think, um, as always, um, you know, just as for LISA itself, it's, it's, a, it's a grassroots effort. Um, I think we, we need to, um, you know, talk a, about future missions. White papers are helpful. Um, going to conferences is helpful. Um, and, and, you know, even being part of the uh, NASA advisory structure. I mean, any astrophysicist um, that's affiliated with the U.S. institution can can volunteer to be a part of that and and, and speak out um, uh, about um, supporting future missions uh, beyond uh, LISA. Um, and my personal experience is that NASA does listen um, to those to those groups. Um, but I think, um, yeah, I, I think that's that's what I have to say. I mean, it's, again, it's disappointing that we didn't get too much um, or not much at all out of the Astro 2020, um, but nevertheless, we need to um, we need to keep pushing. So thanks, David. Okay, let's see. Um, I don't see any questions from the audience at, at the moment, but if there are some, uh, please feel free to uh, type them into the window, uh, into the Q&A. Uh, we do have about 20 minutes left. And we did have some... John, uh, th th this is Martin. Just to note, because I'm a co-host, I actually can't type in the Q&A, but I did post a question into the chat and I'm happy for that to you know, be held in reserve if others have questions or indeed to, to ask it now. No, um, let, let's, let's go for it. I have to find it. Uh, okay, I, I see it. Thanks, Martin. Uh, so this is indeed from Martin Hendry. Uh, I'm wondering if there are were any way of the okay. Let me let me start again. I'm wondering if there were any of the other white papers submitted to Voyage 2050 focusing on uh, EM observations that stood out as being particularly beneficial for gravitational wave slash multi messenger astronomy on the time scales of the projects um, that the white papers were investigating. I think this is um, open to any of the panelists to have. Uh, an answer for that question. Peter says no. Uh, well, yeah, maybe I can say a few words, although I not, uh, don't uh, remember all, all, of, all of the white papers, but I remember there were uh, projects, there was this one project on uh, near-infrared astronomy uh, in an attempt to study high redshift galaxies. So that would that would be kind of complementary to uh, the gravitational wave studies of, you know, uh, massive black holes and the sources of these black holes. Um, but that being said, I, I mean, it's it seems that ESA will not. Uh, so based on the recommendations that Alessandro presented, the, these other interesting electromagnetic uh, projects will, will will not be selected. Uh, yeah, so um, I I mean, I, I don't know, if maybe they would, they could be descaled and uh, and fly as, inter, as, as medium missions. So. Yeah, th thanks, Irina. That was one of the reasons I asked, because we're all aware that the selection of Athena and Lisa, you know, as large missions is, of course, great, but it, it's you know, it, it has created the possibility that they won't necessarily be operating at the same time. And, uh, but nonetheless, from a scientific point of view, it would be really good to have them operating at the same time. That may be an insoluble problem, but I was just curious to know if there were any standout examples like that for the, the time scale of 2050. Uh, yeah, so uh, at, at least there was no coordinated effort between the various uh, white papers. Uh, so it doesn't it doesn't seem like well at, at this point it doesn't seem likely to me that uh, that was the case for twenty fifty. But uh, but other things can happen in the meantime. Mm. 
Okay, thanks, Martin and Irina. Um, let's see, we, we have a couple of more questions that have come in. That, that we have one from Harry Ward, and Harry, if you're able to ask the question yourself, I'm, I'm happy to sure. invite you to do so. Sure, it was really triggered by something that Tuck said uh, yesterday about you know what would be the, the the most important way to move forward with this, and his view was that uh, you know earlier rather than later convergence on you know a, a, a mission target, uh, particularly a science target, but also a, a kind of mission design target would probably be our best friend. So I was just wondering. I mean, it's perfectly feasible and maybe even likely that a study of the experimental feasibilities and costs of these different mission types will will direct us to, to the thing to focus on. But if we don't make that assumption, if we just at the moment say that they're all potentially doable, is there a way to tension the different science cases so that uh, as an overall science community, we could converge sooner rather than later on uh, what we would consider the, the best way ahead from the science return point of view? Yeah, um, let me just say, firstly, Harry, I, I agree with you <clears throat> on that. I think rallying behind a single concept is the best way to go. Um, but I would like to invite Alessandra, um, uh, who wants to say something on this. Alessandra. <laughs> yeah, maybe uh, I could mention the fact that, uh, related also to the question, um, uh, that uh, a couple of months ago, um, actually with John and uh, Stefano uh, Vitale and uh, Michele Valisneri and I um, actually um, have decided uh, to put together a working group, um, we call it Gravitational Waste Space 2050, supported also by Quick, and um, uh, the idea uh, of this group uh, is to, uh, which uh, has very broad expertise, of course, uh, includes uh, people uh, in particular that uh, um, were part of the, um, of the um, teams that submitted the white papers, but there are also other people. Uh, and the idea is to um, produce on a time scale of a couple of years, a document um, which uh, um, uh, basically, it's a result of a study, a detailed study of the different um, uh, missions that have been uh, discussed just in the last uh, half an hour, but quite a detailed study also of the uh, feasibility uh, and uh, the science that this mission can do, uh, and the, um, uh, you know, the uh, whether from the point of view of the cost and the technology, these are possible. So in this process, uh, Perhaps some of these uh, um, uh, proposals uh, may not survive, uh, or perhaps uh, all the three proposals, uh, DCRs, and microRs, and milliRs, uh, will survive. And uh, the idea of this report uh, is to, you know, maybe this will be uh, useful for the uh, study team that then ESA will uh, uh, put together sometime in 2024. Um, and um, anyway, so I wanted just to say that, uh, um, that I think in part perhaps address your question, Harry. Thanks, Alessandra. Um, we actually have another, we have a few more questions that have come in. Um, this next one is from Ira, Ira Thorpe and it's related to what we were just discussing uh, with Harry, but also uh, David Shoemaker's question. And Ira is from, from NASA. Um, and so there's a question about NASA involvement what ideas are there to control costs of these missions that are likely to be cheaper than LISA, which has stressed both NASA and ESA budgets? Do we expect that we will directly compete with other flagship mission, missions or find a cheaper way to access our science? Um, I think any one of the panelists can volunteer to answer. Um, and if we have no volunteers, I'll probably pick on Alessandra again. I think maybe Alessandra, or you might be well equipped to answer that. Uh, no, actually, what I wanted to say that I forgot, but perhaps was evident, is that this working group uh, is uh, worldwide. Uh, in fact, it has many representatives from the US and also actually from Japan. Um, and um, so it's very welcome, you know, that. Uh, um, also NASA get in, involved in, in, uh, in some way. Um, but about the cost, uh, um, so in Voyage 2050, we were told that the L missions should not 
cost more than uh, uh, a billion of euros or one point, maybe one or 1.2. So basically the same cost as today for Lisa. Um, and um, obviously, um, if you want uh, to really realize this mission, we need another agency. Um, it's pretty clear, like for today, for Lisa. Uh, if we didn't have NASA, I don't think we could have uh, uh, Lisa. And um, so it's fundamental that another agency is involved. Now, how to realize that, uh, I don't know. We have to see. Thanks, Alessandra. Do any of the other panelists want to comment on the cost for their mission concepts? You know, the main focus was on the science. Actually, when we were asked to propose white papers, it was explicitly said not to think about money and to go as crazy as you can. Uh, but I think when the um, when they were already considering the proposals, they were thinking how feasible it is in terms of the implementation. Okay, um, um, coming back to the, coming back to the um, the, um, the idea that there, there have been a variety of different decihertz observatories uh, proposed, um, there is also uh, a whole range of different costs associated with those. Uh, obviously, that comes with a trade-off in sensitivity. So the full DeSigo constellation is, is much, more sens uh, much more sensitive and much more expensive than, uh, say, Gadfly. Um, which would, um, so there's a lot you can do. And I think there's, in terms of uh, scope of the mission and the technology used, um, and I think the if we do something Lisa-like, one would hope that there would be maybe less R&D than if we were doing something completely different and that would help with the costs. Um, and I think for, for all of these missions, it's really a, a case of looking at the science case and the trade-off um, then for different sensitivities and, and what, what you can do um, for your, your euro, um, dollar, um, other currency return. Thanks, Christopher. Uh, Stefano Vitali has a comment or a question. Stefano? Yeah, I want to comment on the on the cost. Um, Lisa is not one billion, right? We are uh, heading toward uh, 1.3, 1.4 to ESA, plus the NASA contribution, plus the member state contribution. So the envelope of Lisa is about two billions. But certainly, uh, ESA program as it is shaped uh, can only take mission of this size and for this share. So any mission to be ESA-led should be more or less the same kind of effort of LISA, right? And so one key element of realism is that if it's such a budget, if it is outside that budget, NASA has much bigger capabilities, but then the emphasis should uh, move across the ocean, right? Uh, because it cannot fit the European program. Yes, indeed. Thanks, Stefano. We are, looks like we have about eight minutes left. We still have a couple more questions. Uh, this one's from East Nellemans. Um, how should we deal with the argument that we should wait until we have Lisa results, likely in the 2040s, before selecting the next gravitational wave mission? How do the science cases of the different missions depend on results from Lisa? I, would offer this to any of the panelists who want to respond. Well, uh, I don't know if uh, if I'm very qualified to respond to this, but uh, I would say that when uh, we started working on LISA, we still didn't have results for LISA Pathfinder. So in this similar sense, uh, we don't necessarily need to wait uh, for results from LISA to start working on something new. Yeah, uh, just a comment, you know, when the first LIGO results were coming out, that already changed a bit um, some of the things we were thinking about in terms of LISA. So I think um, it's likely that LISA, well, I think it's, I'm, I'm quite confident, in fact, that, that science that comes out of LISA will impact whatever comes next. Um, but, you know, at the same time, we can't, we can't wait because we know how long it takes to put one of these missions together and to develop the technology. So um, we certainly don't want to wait until the 2040s to start thinking about the next mission. Um, but do any of the other panelists have comments on their particular concepts and how the, the science 
or the mission design might be impacted by what we see from Lisa? So um, on the, the decihertz trains, I think I touched upon that we have a mix of science from things we know we're going to see already from the ground-based detectors to things which are very speculative about the new backgrounds. And so obviously if Lisa sees anything unexpected, that would complicate the mix. Uh, from the decihertz um, science case, I think the most interesting thing is the, the intermediate mass black holes and how they fit into the mass spectrum. So I think if Lisa was able to infer the origins of the massive black holes, maybe see there's a, a minimum massive black hole mass, uh, then that would be uh, a big impact. Uh, but potentially that would only constrain it from one side. So you have minimum mass. It would still be a question of what's the max, how big is the gap? Uh, what is the gap between the, the intermediate mass black holes formed from stellar mass black holes uh, and, and things like that? So I think there's, there's still a science case um, and the, the sort of question is really how do you focus what the objectives are and what are the unexpected things that Lisa brings up which potentially could enrich any, any case. Thanks, Christopher. Does anyone else want to comment on that? Okay, we have another uh, question. This one's coming from Tuck Seven. Uh, he says, experience has shown that large mission concepts are best sold by a unified community. I, you know, I think that's exactly how we, this community sold Lisa in the first place. Uh, he says, what, what is the thinking for unifying the gravitational wave community behind a single viable concept in time for decision? Uh, and then uh, he says, damn that Harry Ward. <laughs> Sorry, Harry Ward. Any thoughts on how this community might be able to unify around a, a single concept beyond Lisa? Or is that, in fact, do you think we should unify around a single concept? Well, I think Alessandra more or less uh, answered that. And by the way, let me just add regarding the previous question. It, this, it's an unfair question that comes up in science all the time, right? I mean, if you find something, then of course we want to know it to higher precision. And that's, you know, if you look back at the uh, last century, that's how we've moved on. If, if we don't find something, then there, there's one more reason to keep looking. So of course, you know, the answer is always independently of what Lisa, whatever the next detector is, we should move forward. That's, I mean, that's civilization. So and that's a pretty clear thing. We need to, I think we're all convinced as scientists, but we do need to convince the funding agencies as well. But I think the answer is very clear to me. Yeah, and I would just add that, you know, the, the, these concepts have a um, you know, great science cases based on what we already know. Um, and I, I can't imagine that the science cases would be worse based on something we learned new from Lisa. Um, and that's, that's how Lisa was sold, right? We, we had a specific science case. Um, what, we have to wait and see what Lisa actually finds. Um, I'm guessing there'll be surprises, but nevertheless, um, the, the, um, the concept was was sold based on, on what we knew at the time. Um, those are all of the questions I have from the audience. We have some discussion points um, generated internally by the panel, but I also see we are about three minutes uh, from the end here. Um, does anyone from the panel want to make any further comments um, before we are about to close? John, there is an um, intriguing and somewhat challenging question that came in from YouTube. Um, I don't think we can really do it justice in three minutes, but it might be worth just drawing that to the attention of the panelists and something for us all to think about after the symposium. Martin, can you can you read it off for me? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, it's in the chat. Um, so this is from Kirsten S., who's a grad student, relaying a question that her parents commonly ask her which is why should the general public care about funding gravitational wave research? What benefits beyond more knowledge could there be? Yes. Great question. Does anyone have a two minute response for Kirsten? Yeah, I can try if I may, even a one Please. minute. 
So uh, that's a, that's a great question, and I'm, I'm sure everybody here I get uh, gets this question a lot. I got this type of question like uh, maybe a few days ago from a friend. I mean, but uh, just think of it: more knowledge is is extremely important, and uh, because with gravitational waves or other types of you know as astronomy, we study the universe, and it has I feel a direct implication about our life, how we understand what is life, what is our place in the universe. And if you think that there was a period in history when people thought that, uh, you know, Earth uh, just sits on free turtles or, you know, the Earth is flat or that uh, the Earth is the center of the universe and how our perception of, of the world has changed throughout history, thanks to science and thanks to our place and how we understand the universe and our place in the world, in the world, I feel that for me it has philosophical implications about life. So that would be my one minute pitch. Thanks, Irina. I think that was a good good response and I, I agree with that. Well, um, this brings us to the end of this panel session. I am very pleased at the level of interest from the community that we've had um, over this past hour. I think this was a great discussion. Um, and with that, I would like to turn it back over to Martin Hendry. Thanks, John, and thanks to all the panelists from me as well. That was a very interesting discussion. So we now move into the final, final part of our um, last day of the symposium. And I will be very brief. Um, I just basically want to thank all of you for your participation. Um, let me begin by saying, of course, it's a pity that we weren't able to meet in person. Um, I first became involved in the planning for the symposium back, I think, probably about 2018 or 2019, when our grand plan was to host everyone in person in Glasgow in 2020. Of course, COVID put paid to that, and uh, we were um, perhaps wise to, to duck out on uh, trying to put something together for 2020. We're grateful to our colleagues from Florida and, and from uh, our, our other um, Lisa colleagues in uh, assembling a symposium online back then. Um, we hope we've lived up to that very high bar that was set um, with the previous online Lisa symposium. I think we have. I think we've done a good job. I'll say more uh, by way of thanking the local organising committee um, shortly. But before I do that, let me just thank the scientific advisory committee uh, who helped me to put together, I think, a very interesting and varied and um, informative program. Uh, I think um, we sought to reflect the current state of the field, but also to capture something of the history of LISA and indeed the exciting future that lies ahead for spaceborne gravitational wave detection. And I think we've accomplished all of that. Thanks also to the SAC for uh, acting as program session chairs, and indeed to all the speakers, both invited and contributed, who um, helped us to um, assemble a really um, interesting program, as I said. Um, what I'd like to do now is turn over the floor for uh, a few minutes to Karsten Dansman, who's going to offer his own thoughts and reflections on uh, where we have reached with Lisa and the exciting future that lies ahead. And then I will come back at the very, very end, just for a final few uh, notes of thanks. So over to you now, Karsten. The screen is yours. Thank you, Martin. Lisa, Lisa Symposium 14, that's where we are. It sounds so innocent, Lisa Symposium 14. You know, what it really means is that we've been doing this for 28 years now for the LISA Symposium. I think I've been in most of these and uh, maybe it's good to see where we started. And uh, that was uh, how do we do this here? Yep. That's the first one. There was Lisa Symposium number one in 1996. And it was not too far from where we would be if we wouldn't be on a laptop screen staring down here. And interestingly, most of these people that we are seeing are still in the team or are here or somewhere. 
And uh, even our hosts are here. At least I can see Harry there a little. Let me see. There he is. Uh, I can't see Martin, but he's probably just hiding behind the screen in there. That was in 1996 uh, or another picture of these things that uh, was also from 1996. That's the Lisa Symposium. And it shows what the general atmosphere was. We are all in a good mood optimistic and we're trying to get it done within a few days next monday or something like that and so we went and uh, two years later we were in lisa in 1998 and we already had finished to something which is still pretty much what we are doing it was a joint isa nasa mission and all the major elements of this are in there in uh, 1998 Another two years later, we had the what's called the cornerstone presentation in Paris, and uh, that was remarkable because it was after the first results of the first industrial study that we had. It was performed by a company that's interesting to see how the names change. It was first called Dornier and then Daimler Chrysler, Daimler Chrysler Aerospace. And uh, there were at least 10 names in between. And nowadays, most people probably call it Astrium. But anyway, there were a lot of results. And uh, so let's carry on what came afterwards. Uh, let's jump into the future. 2004, there was the fifth International Lisa Symposium. It was interestingly near ESTEC. And uh, my opening talk there, was interesting because Lisa was proposed in 1993 and uh, the Lisa launch in those days was consistently quoted as 2011. Interesting, isn't it? Uh, at that time in 2002, we really thought we were half the way up there. And uh, so what I tried to call was Halbzeit. But there was a lot of real work going on. And see, this is another diagram that I showed. There was in 2010. So that's now 10 years after 2000 uh, with a lot of results. And uh, what was mostly going on then was the payload development. The payload development took about 10 years. And you can see the various things that we had starting with the FDR design in the year 2000. Here we see. And then so many things up, down, many angles, cross, no crossed angles, other proof masses. But we got to somewhere where basically we are still. And uh, again, in 2014, we were in Gainesville in Florida. And uh, Guido is still among you listening to this. That was already 22 years after the first Lisa proposal in 1992. Did we make progress? Yes, we did. That was remarkable because in that year, uh, we, for the first time, were selected as the ESA L3 science team. And we finally had an approved slot, which we never had before in those days. And we even had a launch date. And that was the first time we got a launch date in 2034. So everything was looking nicely, but there was still March 2011 lurking in the background. And those of you who were reading Nature, they know this one. Europe makes do without NASA for various reasons. And we had to redesign and uh, was followed by another meeting that I'm not quoting, but something happened. And that was in 2015. And a lot happened in those two years. First of all, gravitational waves were discovered. And I don't have to show you this. One of these, we've heard a lot about it. But there was something else. In the same journal, Physical Review Letters, LISA Pathfinder was launched, which, by the way, was exactly 100 years to the day after the publication of General Relativity by Albert Einstein. And... Uh, here we see the result of this. This is actually in the September of 2015. And this is the real spacecraft. It's ready for launch. And about an hour after this picture was taken, <clears throat> we put this into the box in the background. These are Pathfinder put into an Antonov 124 flying to Tukuru. 
So that only took 17 years after our proposal for 1998, and it worked wonderfully. This is something that will keep us alive for many decades in the coming future, because what you see up here, those were the LISA Pathfinder requirements. That is the real requirement in terms of acceleration noise that you can see here. And that's what we actually got. So we could have gone home, uh, but uh, because it was all done, but we didn't, of course. What we had built was the stillest place in the universe. And just think about it now that we are talking every day about virus in all kinds of various, we had something in our hand more sensitive than the weight of the virus. Maybe we could have kept it away in those days. But then again, another few years or another two years later, we were in 2016, it was in Zurich and something happened again. And that was the NASA mid decadal I haven't talked about the third arm and all the money missing, but then we got something from the US. There was the NASA mid decadal with the recommendation that NASA is in again. And what we got is we got the third arm back here. That's the third arm. So it was missing in a few diagrams and uh, a lot of people were wondering why. And uh, now you know why. That's what we expected. The whole planning went towards this. But then we had to go back to technology again. And there was something we had been working on for a long time, and that is the optics. Look here, the optical bench. Uh, I'm only quoting back to 1999. And then we worked on it and worked and worked and worked and worked over the years, up and up. Uh, and uh, then finally, in 2021, something happened. It was wonderful to see everybody working manually on putting such an optical bench together. It actually worked in the end, but you can't do that for a full LISA mission. And now, here is our Lear friend. That's the robot. And now the robot, the computerized thing, is working on this. And what happened? Look at the number of components in the optics that we had. From early on in 1999, this was the number of optical components in this. And it was, by the way, if you go further to the left, you see it was less than 20. And so whatever we did, it went up and up and up again and again, up to here, up to a place where even with a robot, it was getting to a limit where it's kind of not so convenient. And what happened in 2021? it suddenly came across, we were ready. Because now with our friend, the robot, and everybody else, of course, in uh, north of uh, London, we were supposed to be ready. And you see that the number of components is now pretty much back to where we started 30 years ago. And the best thing is, it's about the same number of components that we had in Lisa Pathfinder. And we proved that it works wonderfully, it worked. So that's off the thing. Now there need to be people to do this. And that's the LISA consortium. The LISA consortium consists of all those things that we all need. It's committees and boards, it's a full board, it's an executive committee. It needs a group of people on the formulation. It needs a, uh, uh, Lisa science group looking at the science and we have many, many committees, as we nowadays know the committees are the most important thing on all things we do for real life, but this year is the most important one in this year. Those were the Lisa early career scientists that's the most important committee that we have. Why am I saying that because it's the most important one. It's what I call, it's the young committee that we have in there. It's the young committee we'll need for the next 30 years that we have to run in order to really get this flying. And you can see it increasing. Right now we have 1,612 members. It's as of today, as of this day. Probably it was about an hour ago. It's probably 1,650 by now. And uh, that means it was these people, the young people who actually made the work. Let me tell you, it was you who made Lisa grow. 
and shine. And you made it shine against all the obstacles. And I tell you, we've had enough of these obstacles over the last 30 years. Without you, we couldn't be where we are right now. And what's more important, you will be the ones who watch all the stuff to take off. I tell you, Lisa is growing into a shining future, into a real shining future. Now, of course, everybody now asks, when? Tja, when is it happening? Okay, I have a little thing. When is it happening? I go back again. I have many of these old slides. Actually, I have all of them going back 30 years. So this is a slide I copied from 2016. That's already an old slide. But there, uh, I was quoting what we were thinking. Nominally, the launch of L2 was in 2028 for Athena. Normally, L3 in 2035, there was Lisa. Athena launch already at that point was widely considered as, quote, in the early 2030s, which you can now see. And we were really reaching far ahead because we were, as the Lisa team, really saying, couldn't we maybe launch Lisa and Athena close together? It would make sense. That was in 2016. That's only six years ago. What did we do now? That's today. It's the same slide, a little modified. The ESA L2 and L3 missions, where are we now? Both missions are too expensive and both missions are too late. Now, that's not so unusual because that's what they all do. They are always too expensive and always late. We have to make something out of it. Athena, unfortunately, is much more this way. Lisa is also a bit over, but it's doable, widely doable. And now we've heard from our topmost people who know where to go in life, told us that Athena will fly whenever ready, but later, probably. Lisa in itself will launch in 2035. You've already seen it before, right? We got it in 2034. 34, 35 is the same. So I can quote somebody who was also kind of well known. We will do. And we are ready to now plan the Lisa follow on. Good luck to all of us. I'll be there in Kourou in 2035, and don't delay it, please. Thank you, that's all. Thank you, Karsten, for those wonderfully inspirational words. Um, how can one follow that? Well, I think there's a, a brief comment that David Shoemaker would like to make, and um, let me pass to him next, and then we will shortly wrap things up. Right, and so I'd say, I, I got the chance to be the one to thank you, Martin, and the whole local organizing committee for doing a remarkable job. I, I, I think that I've been watching closely as we all have are how meetings run in this very strange new time where we, we find ourselves. And I think this is really the paradigm of how one can do the best one can remotely. Evidently, we'd have to meet in person and whenever we can, but for a remote meeting, this was just an, a, really a, an incredible success. So thanks to all who participated, but in particular to you folks who made this meeting actually happen. Well, of course, the peril of online meetings is not being able to unmute oneself. So I have successfully managed that. But yeah, thank you very much, David. Let me just add to that by calling out a few specific names. Of course, uh, Harry, I uh, was um, a, a very steady hand at the helm to um, coordinate us all. But I think Harry and I both recognized that when it came to some of the more arcane IT details, we had to refer to the younger folks in the room, echoing very much what Karsten has just been saying about the, um, the younger scientists within our consortium. So a very special thank you to Mike Perer lloyd to Andrew Errol, Dave Robertson, I'm sure Dave won't mind still being counted as one of the youngsters, um, Rona McTeague and above all Alistair Taylor uh, without whom what David just referred to would simply not have been possible. So thank you to all of them and I do hope we can meet in person for future Lisa Symposia but I think if this 
is uh, what we had to do, then I'm glad that we've done it as well as we have. So um, let's go on to an exciting future for Lisa, and let's hope that we can indeed all meet again in three dimensions before too much longer. May the force be with you. Take care, everyone. We have a final slide. <laughs> Lisa has left the building. <laughs>